Initiate sequence. Another one. <laughs> Initiate recording sequence Initiate episode. Sequence. That's good because it's a sci-fi book today. Yeah, I'm using sci-fi ways of saying things. <laughs> Dude, we Should love to mention the Matrix during this podcast. Maybe. Well, maybe it kind of, it's it's not totally inappropriate for the book. Baudrillard liked it was in <laughs> reference in the Matrix, and he, I think he said something about liking <laughs> Philip K. Dick. <laughs> Uh, Listen, it's Bogart. a little sleepy right We're now. There. We're vibing. We're vibing. Three biological entities <laughs> broadcasting <laughs> on the fucking on, on, uh, on the the e- ether. In the ether. Net. And welcome to the Spinecrackers podcast. Welcome to Spinecrackers podcast. Uh, welcome to Spinecrackers podcast. I'm Matthew. I'm Gabe. Gabe. Gabe I'm Paul. I'm Paul. And to, today. We are discussing renowned science fiction success smash summer hit. <laughs> the Lick. By uh, you say Philip Philip K. Dick. I did not. Is this book? I thought you is, said is, is, this, is this book the equivalent of like a Demi Lovato like summer hit? Is that yeah. what you're trying to say? Smash hit of the summer on the ears of everyone. This book, uh, the summer of uh, oh, holy shit, that's a real song. The summer, summer of sixty nine, dude. Which yeah, is when this book came 69. out. Right. How does that go? Although, Sing it. it was the summer of sixty nine. Sixty nine. That's all I know. That was pretty good. On the moon of the five and die. There you go, bitch. I spray a bit of ube on me. <laughs> you know I'm never gonna die. <laughs> Chilling in a suspended state. <laughs> oh, it's gonna last forever. <laughs> this is the best time of my death. <laughs> oh shit! Wow, Weird Al needs to. You know what, Weird Al? Hey, I know you listen. I know, motherfucker. Yeah. Weird Al, friend of the pod. You can buy that off us if you want. Are you suggesting that Weird Al make just another mediocre, not funny song? Oh, that he's done? Dude, 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 shut you don't do this. your fucking mouth, bro. <laughs> you don't want to do this right now, Paul. You are outnumbered instantly. Also, Bill Murray is not funny. It never well, has been. That's a you different... want to get into that? No. No. <laughs> also, it's wrong. that's false, but it's not quite as false. I would agree that Bill Murray is overrated, but it, mm-hmm. get the fuck away Thank from you. Weird Al. Yeah, I've never hey. laughed once at anything he's done. You're just... Get your get your grubby mouth off of talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> if you listen to Hardware Store, that that song, which is an original, is mind mm. is a mind blowing work of lexical complexity, <laughs> where he rhymes a like two hundred word list of different things you can buy at the hardware store. What do you got to say about that, Paul? Yeah, Paul. Um, just keep explaining why humor is funny to me. Yeah. Wow. Wow, dude. Someone's oh. someone's salty. So is someone? I think. Okay, dear listener, someone's a little salty tonight, and it's Paul. <laughs> I'm not salty. I'm in pain, and it's affecting my mood. Do you want to talk? About, do you want to give some details about your pain to the listeners, Paul? Not particularly, <laughs> but I do have irritable bowel syndrome type stuff, and it's hitting me hard all day, and I yeah. don't want to do much but here we are talking about book i'm talking about hey, talking well, about book talk <laughs> <laughs> listen to be fair paul this was if you didn't like the book or you don't want to talk about it you have no one to blame but yourself because this was your pick you that's picked. not what i'm saying oh okay that's not what i'm saying i didn't 
You guys didn't laugh. This book. So this Philip K. Dick. What's his, what is his deal? Died very young because he's a psycho drug head. Was he? Here's the question I was going to ask earlier. I know Philip K. Dick was deep into drugs, but was it? Was it like like sad like actual drug addiction or was it like Hunter S. Thompson style like experimental like let's get weird with it? He had a stroke. I really have no. Well, idea. I know, but I'm, <laughs> it doesn't answer my question. <laughs> I I mean, who's to say, right? Like he was not a healthy man. Yeah. What kind of drugs was he into? Do we know? Amphetamines. Let's Google it right now. Is Every that right? all these yeah all, all these motherfuckers <laughs> like cocaine. They were they were like stringing together like like uh, uh, you know Harlan Ellison and like uh, 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 L. Ron Hubbard and mm-hmm. I don't know I, I just feel like amphetamines are like the common thread amongst so many authors of like was he speedballing yeah okay so probably. a scanner darkly 1977 was the first book he wrote without using speed damn so he was a speedhead he was a speed freak yeah he wrote yeah. all of his books on speed ex- up to that point and that That's was really wild. late in his career. Okay. He died in what? 84 or something? 82. Yeah. Phil um, K. dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Had to do he, it. He, uh, yeah. So he was, he was a drug addict for a lot of his time. And he lived eventually, like, he got divorced. He was married and divorced, like, I think it was five times. But, like, in one of those instances, interim periods before his next wife, he was just, like, his life was literally like he just had drug addicts live in his house. Like he just like a bunch of speed freaks all just, he's just like, you can just crash here (laughs) and uh, just live in my home. And he was like basically just living in a crack house (laughs) writing books. Was he, um, I don't, cause I don't, I I knew he was a drug, had drug problems and all that. And, but, but I didn't know much about his life other than he died relatively young. Um, Was he like wealthy in his lifetime? Like, did he, do, do we know, like, were his books, because Blade Runner, the movie, I would have came out when, so. right? Yeah, he was definitely, he, and yeah, and he saw the first. He saw Blade Runner, right? He saw Blade he Runner, saw yeah. a yeah. cut of it, he, yeah. yeah. He must have been dead, like, he was very definitely, soon after that, though. Yeah, I think I remember, like, watching the Blade Runner documentary and him seeing the initial shots, but I, I think he might have died, like, soon after that. But then again, Blade Runner came out in, like, 81 or so I think 80. so. That would have been the year before he died, then. Yeah. So I I don't think he ended up seeing the final cut or the cut. He knew that but like I him, yeah. it was so different in terms of its android interpretation because everyone knows Ridley Scott is obsessed with androids. So mm-hmm. and like them being good. Um, but he actually, well, I remember in the documentary it said that he did. He like saw the opening shots of Blade Runner with you know with the flames and the eye and everything. Um, and he said that it was like exactly what he was thinking. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, I feel like I don't believe him. Why, I feel like why? he saw something. I feel like he saw something cool as shit, and he was like, "No, yeah, yeah." <laughs> so you, I know wait, you, about so his you think you think he was you think he was trying to? Why would he try? He doesn't need to really ride someone else's ar- artistic coattails though. At that I'm point, just, I don't know. I'm just messing. That would be fun. But I just it's just like, oh, dude, no, yeah, no, this is yes, this is what I. Cool. It's like you're in my head, dude. Like do, when you do, make all. Do you the... guys want to know something? Something that's true that I've told you before. What's that? Yes. I've never seen Blade Runner. Oh right, right. Is right, that right. is that real? <laughs> Dead ass true. Hundred percent. Wow. I know. About... Like I know what happens, and I know the quotes and the fucking tears in the rain, some fucking monologue, and I know all that shit. But I've never actually seen the damn thing. Wow. It's nice. It's a good movie. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I would watch it for sure. Okay. Well, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and I've um, never read, I, and I've never, ball? I've never read the book. And I've this is actually my first Philip K. Dick book ever. Oh yeah, this that's only my third. What, which other ones have you read, Paul? I read A Scanner Darkly first when I was like sixteen and remember nothing about it. And I read Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep maybe when I was like twenty five. Which was only two years ago. So, um, <laughs> interesting. But I, I don't really remember that much about that either. I liked, I liked that one more than a scanner darkly. Here's a, being confused. Here's a really dumb, dumb I'm, question. I'm is, is there any relationship between a scanner darkly and the film Scanners? No. Okay. No. That's it. Okay, that's the answer then. 
Scanners. One of the one funny it. thing yeah, about is a great uh, movie. I have seen that one. I love that movie. About the the mo- like the books that were made into movies. One of them is Paycheck, which I'm pretty sure is with Mel Gibson. Cancel. Mel Gibson is in a and movie I, called I, in called Payback. Oh, okay. That's what I'm thinking. I don't know what Paycheck is. Me neither. Me either. I thought it was Payback, and I was like, that's a Philip K. Dick movie? Because that movie's crazy. <laughs> that's just like a noir, like, funny... It's like Guy Ritchie on a budget. But it's interesting... Um, well, okay, Matt, how many of his books have you read? Probably more than us. No, no. Uh, the same kind of standard. I just... I think the common thread is, like, do androids dream of electric sheep? Obviously. Obviously. Standard dork diet therefore blade runner the film leading me to the source material uh and then i read uh flow his tears the police flow my tears the policeman said what Uh, is that about again i don't really know it's about a guy who and and obviously we said what what was the number of books Dick actually ended up publishing in his lifetime. 45 novels and over 100 short stories. Yeah, like 120 short stories. And it's like... You I, know, I, I just typed in, flow my, flow my dick, the policeman said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to see the fucking results you got for that, dude. Yeah. Uh, luckily, it autocorrected to the normal thing. but. Uh. <laughs> did, did you mean... Uh... uh yeah, I, I, once again, not. I read that. I read those things as a teenager. That was like my big. That's like the kind of well that I'm still drawing from in terms of a lot of like my sci-fi references because that's when I read the most sci-fi and fantasy. Is probably, mm. I would say, a, a period of like when I was like twelve to about sixteen, and I've just I've just been drawn from that while dr- while moving away from it in time. So right. my memories are like slowly deteriorating. Yeah, I, it's the same thing. Like. I uh real like uh it's more of like a sort of um sh- swapped identity story than anything else. Um the p- the but, policeman one. Yeah, yeah. But but a similar notion and it's way more emphasized also the theme of uh you know, what's real and what's not in a more overt way in the Do Andrew's Dream of Electric Sheep. But yeah, mm-hmm. the, those themes are definitely like front and center always like you're just in a new world. You're just a new person, and everyone's like, "No, you're this guy. No, you're actually this guy, or whatever." And you, it's that that tended to be like in my three so far. That's tends to, that seems to be the biggest thing. Mm. And Dick is like, I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't, I, I don't have a ton of experience in science fiction as a genre. I read a lot of uh, Star Wars novels, but that's so uh, that's my that those are my sort of guilty pleasure, just vibe not guilty pleasure you know what fuck you star wars yeah, novels exactly. are fucking awesome <laughs> and lick my balls if you disagree um, <laughs> creature comfort yeah exactly um but dick is kind of like one of the big right like it, well, it's weird because i feel like he's like one of the 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 sort of you know i don't know i don't know what the term is like major figures in science fiction but i also feel like yeah he, he doesn't get I don't know. Maybe maybe I get the sense that he's a little polarizing in the like sci-fi community because he's not as uh I don't know. He's not as like technical as some people or he's not as like hard sci-fi as, as some other people might yeah. want or or you know, he's a little more philosophical or whatever. He's, I don't I just he, don't know. He's like yeah, he's like more and this is just part of the druggy vibe that may not be necessarily fair in characterizing him but yeah he he gets more lumped in with especially like the cover art for all his shit and stuff he, with like the 60s fucking mm-hmm. like psych, psychedelic like eastern and and you know this book kind of corroborates on that a bit like you know uh east meets west like right. ori- orientalist kind of spiritualism bleeding into the psychedelic and like LSD movement of of specifically like California in the early 60s uh, I think that's mostly what he gets tagged with, and like how that like blew people's minds, man, and like showed clo- the you know the clockwork elves, and like uh, <laughs> and and the you know yeah how we're just spirits residing in like fucking meat suits, man, and we, <laughs> right. we can migrate wherever and that kind of thing. I think that's more what he gets hit with. It's it's Which isn't necessarily like how I re- I've experienced his books. I don't I I don't really fit him into that. 
I think I think he does have his own unique voice, and I don't. Well, you, I don't really you, see him. I don't know what you're gonna say. I was just saying you. We were texting earlier about like just the feeling of reading his writing style, and well, this yeah. is something that it, that it, I I think yeah is not conveyed in any of his representations outside of his writing, which you know obviously you, it's like whatever, uh, and also like all the filmic stuff because you know he's a huge pop culture i mean there's literally a show on like amazon prime video the man in the high castle was an amazon prime video series yep. you had do androids dream of electric sheep or something is or electric dreams i think is like philip k dick inspired black mirror style anthology stuff so like he's still actively like inspiring and has his name attached to like triple a fucking streaming media for and, sure you know, Blade Runner is like the flagship, but like Minority Report's a big thing, yep. and uh, Tom Cruise. Yeah, and also yeah. a great movie. <laughs> Potentially one of these really authors good. who's had some superior film adaptations to the stories themselves in some mm. ways. Like I definitely think Blade Runner is that. Um, what about Total Recall. Yes, I was yeah, watching Total some of that Recall. today. Yep. Uh, again, yeah, an identity swap, like a guy who's not sure if he is whatever who he said thinks he is and uh but we were talking about like the weirdness of his actual writing style like i don't know if you guys want to elaborate on that but just like what do you mean what did you mean when you because we were all kind of agreeing but what did you guys mean i mean i i, I can just say my like for this this being my first phil k dick book i mean it, it i it was this and like i was i was really hunting for like specific sentences or passages or whatever that could convey what I was feeling, but like couldn't really find any. I have a couple that are like maybe, maybe what I'm trying to get at, but like there's this pervasive sense of just like something here is not fucking fitting. Like something is not clicking the right. It's like, a I don't know if it's a pacing or, 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 or if it's the language choices <laughs> or if it's the, it's the fact that he refers to, all of these, and this book has a lot of characters, but they're always referred to by their full names. And like, <laughs> yes. there's just so many like weird little things that like, I just, I, I constantly felt, it almost felt like it was like on a lag. Like I was watching a video feed of something, but it was like lagging and like chopping somehow in a way that was like very jarring. And I, it, to this day, up to this moment, don't really know what to make of it. I don't know if it was like, I don't know if it was just bad or if that was like intended or I, 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 I well, it's this very actually makes me happy though. Cause I, I have this feeling when I read a lot, cause I, I really have to like, you know, feel out how the writing, the writer's writing style is. And I actually had, I had this feeling in the Ah Chang book quite a bit. I mean, I don't want to go into why maybe I had that feeling again. But it does happen to me a lot, and I'm actually glad this happened to you because it is important. It's important to how you experience the whole novel and the ideas within the novel. But, I mean, I remember having this experience when I read his other two novels that I've read, and I had it again this time. It's just like it, it feels like someone who's, like, words are taken out or something, or he's obviously on amphetamines trying to reel it in. <laughs> Like or you know, like it's just choppy and sporadic, and um, it's odd. There's something odd and off about it, and it doesn't pacing, flow well. It doesn't. It's just yeah. it's, it's not just off. enjoyable. I think it's the pacing uh, of certain elements that we've, you know, maybe detrimentally to the story, but also in ways that might be a, a, a strength and a bizarre, like his weakness is a strength somehow of, of just not really giving a shit about mm. uh, unfolding things that we are expecting to, to just be paced in a more dramatic way or, or used have a turn of phrase used about them or whatever. He's just, he seems to not really give a shit about that. He's definitely, hmm. yeah, there, I, I think as much as I hate to just harp on like drug addiction, like, it's hard to avoid, I think. Amphetamines and just amphetamized thinking and just <laughs> pumping out these books. Is, there's not all the nice things are, are not going to be included. <laughs> none of this shit, do we? Uh, but yeah, and then just like that mixed with like the full name thing is actually a sticking point. Right? That, and no, also what their names are. 
Yeah, well, yeah. The can I talk about? Can I go so first, fucking, please? Yeah, please? Please, please, we should probably <laughs> talk about what relate. the book's about at some point. Yeah, we yeah. should. Yeah. Well, that's but, hard um, too. I did want. I was thinking while I was reading this is maybe he writes this way because he thinks that this is like a futuristic way of writing. I, that was a dumb thought I had. Like maybe he thinks people in the future would talk in this way, but it also relates to the names. Like I think the names, especially in this novel. Are some of the, some of the worst names I've ever read in a novel. Like the the main guy's name is Joe Chips. <laughs> it's just Joe um, Chip. There's, there, oh, it's Joe Chip. <laughs> um, but yeah, not, but literally every other person's name I just thought was like awkward and weird, and it just felt like he was trying too hard, and, or he didn't think enough about them. Yeah, it just, that's it just, more what I was like. Yeah. Joe Chip. Everyone has these goober goober names, and they're all running around, and everyone's, <laughs> and it's just like Joe Chip said this, and then Joe Chip also said this to, <laughs> yeah. to, to Alan Runciter or whatever, or, uh, whatever his name is. Runciter, like, Glenn, one of the worst names Glenn I've Runciter, heard. Glenn Runciter, and then Pat Conroy, uh, Ray came Noble, in. Don. Uh, what was the Don name? That one got Don me. Denny. Don Denny. Like why? What about there was a Henry. Zoe. Aunt. Who was the Zoe? That was my that was my least favorite one. Zoe? Zoe something. You mean Zoe? 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 Was there a Zoe? I don't remember the Zoe. Zoe Zworth? Don't oh, she was that. later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something Zworth. I mean, yeah. there's kind of a there's kind of a almost like a, a, a Marvel Comics naming convention going on with some alliteration and, yes, or whatever. Yes. Uh, and maybe it, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's it could just be that we are like being. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's like a cultural thing that those names were like more made more sense in the late sixties. I have no idea. Like, but this isn't us reading Chinese literature. This no, is uh, a man in the sixties and seventies <laughs> writing about how, how people's names would be in nineteen ninety two. This that's true. It takes that's place true. in thirty years. It's like this people's last names change that much. That's a good point. Yeah, this chip, book, this Joe Chip. What is that, dude? Joe Chip. <laughs> Joe Chip. I can't wait to root for Joe Chip. And I, I, I know, like, <laughs> the worst I, hero name I've ever heard. I, think. I, I know, you know. I just want to flag that I know that this probably sounds really petty that we're like just harping on like his names and shit. But like, it's part of a whole experience of reading this book that is there. Those little details add up in this really fucking like maddening way. Where you're just like, I, yeah. I I don't, I have read the name Joe Chip a thousand times and like something feels wrong in all of these sentences <laughs> and I'm kind of freaking out. Like that was like my, <laughs> that was my experience reading maybe this he wants you, Maybe his experience is he wants you to feel like he's on cocaine. Yeah, like maybe. He just by speed. Just, style. He had a lot of psychosis speed. because of it too. He's, he's a mentally unwell man and like. Yeah. You know, he's he's had he had he'd had suicide attempts and shit. I just I feel like it comes across. It does. That this individual I did want to say too though, it's I, maybe I don't want to sound like we're snobs either cuz I've I mean, I read maybe 3 of the Game of Thrones books, so makes me a nerd. And also Gabe said he loves Star Wars books, so it's we're not, not being about, snobs. No, 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 no. And and again, I I I'm genuinely like undecided about how I feel about the whole experience. I'm just trying Me to. Too. I'm just trying to figure out how to express it clearly. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I feel like I'm failing because, like, I mean, there's also the the um, the fact that yeah, it takes place in the far the far future of 1992, and uh, so there's all these made up words. Yeah, it's kind of like just the homeo pape machine and right. and uh, the scion and 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 it, it yeah, like. There, there's a lot of just also made up words, and and that really invites the particular quirks of the writer who's concocting them, you know, to just whole cloth invent things for a future. Yeah, I don't I don't know. It, it, so just all these words that that alienate you in a sense or, or take you out, and yeah, it's sci-fi. But I think I highlighted something that was um. This is actually kind of a better passage it's not quite as it doesn't really do what i'm i'm, I'm trying to describe either but i liked it it's, and there are was, some really good passage there's some good chunks in here too for sure this is um this i just wrote this phrase sci-fi next to this 
I mean, this book uh, does have like 10 out of 10 sci-fi elements. No question. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just read this little chunk here. And I wrote sci-fi next to it. Uh, we asked Joe Chip to go in there and run tests on the magnitude and minitude of the field being generated there at the Bonds of Erotic Polymorphic Experience Motel. Chip says it registered, at its height, 68.2 BLR units of telepathic aura, which only Melopone, among all the known telepaths, can produce. <coughs> the technician finished. So that, that's where we stuck Melopone's ident flag on the map. And now he, it, is gone. Did you look on the floor behind the map? It's gone electronically. The man it represents <laughs> is no longer on Earth, or as far as we can make out, on a colony world either. Runciter said... I'll consult my dead wife. And I was just like, sci-fi! So, so very sci-fi, but that also does kind of capture the weirdness of what I'm talking about. Like, like, did you yeah. check under the thing? Like, 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 no, it's gone electronically. Like, that, yeah, that so it does capture that weirdness a little bit. A and a lot of... A Collapse, whatever. Me. What do they call it? Like just um, mashing words together, uh, but just like ident flag and stuff. Like yeah. stuff Joyce would do as like a linguistic joke, but it's like now it's meant to be more of like uh, an indication of future language, which is kind of true. Also, uh, I was speaking of weird names and also just weird plot devices. At the beginning of the book, I got the vibe that was like, oh, S. Dole Melipone, which, by the way, what? <laughs> Paul's like, well, it's just a name, pants. dude. It's, it's not just a name. It's just a guy is trying to be living his life. <laughs> this is giving me the giggles. S. Dole Melipone. <laughs> I, I was like, so funny. About this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh, the, here's wow. our, here's our, you know, here's our villain. He's like the most powerful psychic, and they're gonna have to, and he's disappeared off the grid, and now we're gonna have to go try to find S. <laughs> Dole Melipone, <laughs> the most powerful telepath, and he just. <laughs> He just <laughs> disappears and never comes back to the story at all. <laughs> and then you're like, maybe it's Hollis. Right. I thought maybe Pat. I thought it was maybe Pat, but it's not. Well, there's a lot of twists and turns. Okay, maybe oh, we God. should, after half an hour into talking about it, we should probably say what the book is about. I can't. I can't Paul, you want to give it a now. shot? <laughs> Paul, no. you fire away. I'm too fragile. Why are crying laughing at Estol Mel? Why is it? It's so funny. Live television, folks. I'm just not gonna. I'm not gonna be able to get through it. There's a guy named, a guy named Jory in this story. It's Corey with a J. <laughs> Corey with a J. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Uh, <laughs> Jory. <laughs> Jory was one of the worst ones. He's the villain. He's the main villain. He, well, spoilers. Okay, it's always <laughs> <know>. spoilers. Jesus. Oh my god. I haven't, laughed, to... I haven't lost Ooh. it like that in so long. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> The power who would, of this book. Who would win, Jory or S. Dole Melipone? <laughs> you can't say it. You can't say it. <laughs> or Joe Chip. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, this is terrible content. <laughs> we got to get it together. Yeah. We love you. We love you, listeners. Yeah. Thank you for sticking with us. <laughs> Joe versus <laughs> Jory at the end. <laughs> Who's gonna win? <laughs> Who's gonna no, win? Jory is just Joker Corey. <laughs> yeah, that's Corey, right. He was a Joker. <laughs> <laughs> God, oh my Fuck. God, it hurts, dude. Fuck. What? Yeah. What is happening? Uh, Jory, Jory. <laughs> <laughs> 
Jory is definitely joker <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, okay. My, te- my temples <laughs> fucking hurt, dude. Oh. <laughs> what a mess. What an absolute mess. We've made a, a dog's a dinner of it or whatever it is. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, listeners. It just sometimes you get the giggles. <laughs> Uh, oh, we, oh, okay. Here we go. Here we go. That's, <sighs> yeah, mm. that's been building up just from the just the psychic <laughs> residue of whatever this book yeah, is. Seriously, honestly, it kind of makes sense that that just happened <laughs> oh, with <yeah>. this book. <coughs> well, okay. well, because it, it's kind of like a futuristic corporate <laughs> espionage, would you say? <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah, it definitely well, is. It start well. It starts out that way, but then it kind of, yeah. but then it kind of zigs and zags. It kind of turns into. Uh... <laughs> now it's Matt's turn. <laughs> oh god! It's just when you think the book's gonna zig and zags. <laughs> Oh my god, dude. That's just dick for you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, we're not even that drunk, everybody. No, we're not. I had no one Budweiser. Not drunk at all. I had one Budweiser. <laughs> oh god. Oh shit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> 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 Uninterrupted, like eight <laughs> minutes. <laughs> <What's laughing? laughs> just people laughing. Okay, so uh, Paul, yeah, Paul, you you were talking about the corporate espionage angle, which it is, right? Because the book takes place in a world where <laughs> where it's 1992, 1992, and psychic activity <laughs> is like normal, right? Yeah, well, and it's there's, actually uh, there's yeah, precogs, which are actually in the Minority Report, right, in the book, and that was written. In, I think, 54? Was it that early? In, yeah. Yeah, so it was like the years before this book was written. And I'm not sure if this book's considered like a sequel or not, but uh, precogs are just people that <clears throat> are basically telepathic. Matt. <laughs> uh, um, so what? This, this, <laughs> this book... <laughs> Feel, feel free to jump in, Gabe. I'm here. I'm here. No, so yeah. so so basically, in this world, there's <laughs> there's people who do like psychic interventions. There are like precogs and people who read minds and shit like that, right? And, and it's part of like the corporate. Yeah, and there's companies for that, right? You hire companies if you know if I don't know if you want to know if your wife's cheating on you or whatever. You can hire a psychic to come and like read their mind and follow them and shit. And then yeah, but then there are other companies who have people who can counteract those powers and you can hire them to try to like kind of thwart the people from the first type of company which is kind of what this company that we follow throughout the book that, does right the right run 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 sitter and associates run sitter <laughs> don't we can't with the name no, no, i just got a hold of myself um <laughs> Well, it's it's it it mirrors the two because there's ba- I would say there's basically like it's just like a two act essentially structure. It's just like I, I think it's lopsided <clears throat> in how long it is, but like it's essentially like he throws out all these fucking ideas. There's I mean, the main so thing much is here. the main thing right away is, and I it even shows up in the in the quote I read where he's like, "I'm going to talk to my I'll consult my dead wife." Like the key idea to seed right at the beginning which he does is that uh when you die if you if you uh they found a way where like if they can get you in on ice and in cold storage um fast enough they can put you in what's called half-life which seems to be this just like weird purgatory where you know they can use some sort of like ghostbusters technology to like keep your (laughs) keep your spirit like floating around in some like nether realm and and 
like I, which I assume is part brain activity, part just like weird Tibetan mysticism right. on uh, Dick's part. And, and but then, but um, but the other key thing is that, like you said, man, that quote: people from people who are still alive can still communicate with you, yeah, via some like headsets and mics and shit. Right. Yeah. It, it's it's cool. The world is, it's like this global thing, but it's it's very small because it's just literally like, you mostly flit through this weird futuristic moratorium or whatever. Or in, not moratorium, in, but uh, uh, Switzerland, uh, right? Yeah, the whatever the mausoleum thing. No, I think they call it a moratorium, right? The yeah, it, or it's no, in, wait, uh, whatever. Moratorium is not the right word, probably. Yeah, uh, but it's in Zurich, and you know, I, it's funny. It, like, kind of mimics the uh, the the kind of you know, one one could say progressive, or it's just allowable uh, voluntary death kind of stuff that's going on around the like right. Nordics and things. Um, but yeah, mostly it's just like that, and then like you said, basically they they at some point they kind of jokingly not jokingly but like I think the joke is like there's uh, people with these talents like psionism and telepathy, uh, and then like so Runciter runs what he calls an anti-talent agency, right? Which, which is, is where <laughs> he's just like we need people who can. Who are so have are so anti talented in in telepathy that they actually cancel out <laughs> someone's telepathy, right? Um, and uh, yeah, it's basically just these two corporate entities existing. I, I kind of thought of like there's sort of an X Men, yes, definitely du- duality going on here, where it's like we got to keep normies from having a fighting chance, so we can't let a telepath go into your company and steal all your corporate secrets by reading your mind, right? Uh, so if you need, we can hire a person to, that can just like find them immediately and negate their abilities, and and that's it. It's just those are like the two most profitable like business ventures ever since like it was known that there were people with like extra sensory abilities and stuff. What one thing that I <clears throat> yes, and we've covered probably the first thirty pages plot wise because, mm-hmm. but but one th- one thing that I'll just say is that like. And I know this is a kind of like a cringe kind of like sci-fi like fantasy nerd term, but like I was not thrilled with the world building in this book. Like it felt a little under like it's all it's 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 like Dick's method in this book is at least and I don't know about his other books. Maybe you guys can speak to this a little bit more is like pretty much to just fucking drop you in it and explain nothing. And like, you can, you kind of just pick it up along the way, which, you know, that, that can be effective, but I don't know how effective it was here for me. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. Cause it's such a short book and it moves so fast. Like, I mean, there's a, I mean, and I think most of his books are pretty short. Like, like androids is a pretty short novel, but there, I would say there's really great world building in that one. I mean, it gave birth to, to, to Blade Runner, obviously. But I would agree with you this one. Yeah, which actually he didn't write. I know. The actor. Improv. Came that's, up with that on the day. That's more, improv. that speaks more He's like. He's improv actor. Gesturing. That that speaks more to like how sparse and kind of skeletal the, the, the environment anyway, I would say. Right. Of, of where these characters are is like where you can create, like no one really tells you fucking anything. Right. About, like, where they're at. There's doors, and they go into buildings and whatever, but, like, they're in a flying car. You know, there's, like, that level of description. Yep. But, yeah, as far as literal environment description or whatever, just, like, setting. It's very... nothing. Yeah, basic. Which is why, like, Ridley Scott can go and and concoct an entire aesthetic that will... Mm. (laughs) And look for the future that will, like, be mimicked to this day. And it has nothing to do with anything Philip K. Dick wrote. So you, so you think that that's something that's consistent through what you've read of Dick? It's not just like this book? Yeah. yeah he's, I mean, he's, even, with, even with androids, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's like entirely full flesh, fleshed out at mm-hmm. all. The mm-hmm. ideas are there and they're vivid enough that you can get a sense of what the world is. But I will say that Matt's right. Like Ridley Scott like painted a huge picture to fill in those gaps mm. and like amplified I mean, I don't really like even like that book. I think really Scott amplified the story and made a better movie than um, 
Dick made a book. <laughs> the, the key for that one is that Philip K. Dick did not like androids. He was not like, oh, it's, right. it might be cool to be an android. He's like, these are horrifying creations that are not human, and you should never think they are. Right. And then Ridley Scott's like, but what if they... But imagine maybe, that they were, though. Yeah. Because I love them, uh, and I'm in love with, and I'm in love with them. Uh, <laughs> and then you know and you I see that Harrison extended Ford, out. Kiss him on his lips. You see that extended out into like Prometheus and stuff, where he's just like, I love the android. Uh, <laughs> so here's the rest Phil- of the plot. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I I think partially the like, uh, it, it they do mirror each other a bit. Uh, the the two segments like. You never Hollis is the one the like pseudo terrorist almost, but it seems like he's a terrorist, but he's also running a legit well, the, company of somehow. That's also one of the weird things about like the the book is sort of um the world that it presents is kind of like implicitly Yeah, Hollis, who is the guy who runs the like pro psychic company that they're trying mm-hmm. to that Runciter and Associates are trying to like constantly, you know, outdo and outmaneuver and, and whatever, whatever. <clears throat> But like the world itself is is sort of, and again, we don't get a we don't get a really good handle on the politics. Uh, they they live in something called like the North North American like Association or something, right? I forget the name yeah. of the exact like place or the political formation that they exist in. But you know, everything it's like a libertarian dystopia sort of like everything has to be paid for, including like, you know, yeah. it, it costs like 10 cents. It costs like, it costs like five cents to open the door to your fucking apartment right? to open <laughs> right. your, to open Fridge. your refrigerator. Right. Yeah. Or to yeah. pick up your phone costs. Everything costs. It's these like, in, in, in this, this was sort of one of the like kind of uh, interesting, you know, if you talk about, you know, sci-fi as kind of predicting the future or whatever, it's, it's the, it's basically microtransactions, right? It's yeah. like, you have to, kind of like, pay for as a literally metaphor, everything. It's it, it's effective. Like it's funny and it, and it feels true today even if if not in as archaic a form, you right. know. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that those those little things about his sci-fi world building are the are the things that are actually still resonate now about his work the most, I would mm. say. Um like I think in Do Andro- in Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, he talked about like the crosswalks talking. You know, mm-hmm. like, don't walk, don't walk in Blade Runner. And um, that was entirely Dick's idea. And I think he, he actually just has, like, a... He had a good knack of thinking about um, the world and how... Like, what it could turn into. And just... He, he was pretty smart with his little sci-fi... Or just at least futuristic ideas of what might happen with our technology or just how with our society or whatever. And, you well, know... Yeah, go ahead, man. I just... I, I know he was... Uh, at least at some early stage, he he was pretty anti he's he's pretty anti communist like anti Reds mm, kind of stuff. Interesting. Um, but he was also lefty, like super lefty as well. You know, California San Francisco guys. And I know <clears throat> at one point, it, based on potentially involvement with his one of his ex wives and and the socialists, uh, he he had he's had some he had some run-ins with the FBI. He had like mm. a, maybe a couple. Like they came to his house and he dealt with them. And then at one point, it's I think it's confirmed that they, he, there was an incident where his house was broken into and he didn't know who it was and he kind of went off, off on a psychotic break a bit after oh, that. Shit. Um, and it was, I think it was confirmed that that was also the FBI like rummaging through his shit. So he, he was kind of, he was monitored. Uh, what did he do? <laughs> what for? Drugs? I don't know. Like, oh. I, I, Lefty uh, shit, I, dude. I mean, back in that back in the day, in the fifties, yeah, like, the FBI would literally just show up to your house oh, if you were like, I, yeah, the 50s. I am a leftist. Yeah, it was probably yeah. the OSS at some point while he was doing right. that. You know, like, yeah. So some and of this that paranoia is, is and justified. This, and this book has some pretty, uh, you know, pointed critiques of, of capital and sort of, like, advertising culture and, like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, sort of, you know, quick fix kind of, like, mentalities. and so, like, I, We haven't really talked about what, Ubik is or Ubik itself, um, right? But so here's here's the the quick and dirty of the rest <clears throat> of the plot, as far as I understand it. And the plot is not I don't know. We might disagree about what even happens in the fucking book. Yeah, maybe. So basically, there's a guy who works uh, 
for for Runciter. Uh-huh, <laughs> I'm not I'm, I'm not gonna say his name. Um, not Joe Chip. It's the other guy. Yes. G G G G Ashwood or Asher. Okay. What, what is it? Ashwood or Asherwood? I forget. Ashwood, I think. Ashwood, but that one Ashwood. Not as funny of a name, but he. No. Um, it's sort of like a recruiter who goes out and finds people. He finds a young girl who has this crazy talent where she can basically new. new talent that they haven't seen before where she can basically like she can't time travel but she can like rev- like like revert to a previous time state up to a point or something she can just kind of like set a reset button like back to a it's like save states and speed running she can kind of like <laughs> like well, she can she can like change something though like i think she used the example of her like she her parents were precogs yes and they when she was a kid she broke a vase or something and they punished her like three weeks before it happened <laughs> which is yeah. a big thing about minority report right um but then after it happened the time was still present but she changed the thing breaking right so it's not like she didn't revert it back to a time well, you know, she, she, it was the same time, but she just. This is the, this the is shit. kind of the thing. It's like unclear exactly how it works. Yeah, um, it's like partially the secret. Yeah, it's kind of like like the she kind of is just like that. Actually, is not true, and then eventually it isn't. It 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 did re- yeah right right it did remind but she does me... splinter it off. It's kind of it actually reminds me of the Great Work of Time a bit, where like it seems like what it does is do that thing like that yeah. they called orthogonal yes. logic, where like she just splinters off. Yes. On a sort of um, you know perpendicular path. Well, it also I mean it, it, it also reminded me of the lathe of heaven where the guy can change yeah. the shit in his dreams yeah, and only he really notices that. it. And for everyone else, that just is reality. Right. But he's the you know that's kind of what she does, except it's more intentional. It's not like something that she does inadvertently. And um, similarly, the people have like it takes a minute for people to forget right. the prior reality. Right. And it, there's, like, there's still like these little, like yeah they realize something is off, but they can't like say what it is or whatever. So anyway, okay, they find this girl, they bring her on, and then they get this big contract. They have to, there's someone, there's like a rich Wall Street guy who's doing some new thing on the moon, and right. they... Right, this is where it turns into Inception, basically. Yeah. Like Leonardo DiCaprio is in this book. Basically. And so they hire the firm to take all of their best, um, you know, their best... Inertials. Anti, inertials, they call them, right. The, anti, the anti-talent people. To take all of their best inertials to the moon and uh, try to stop Hollis and his <laughs> psychics, his size, from doing their dastardly <laughs> shit. So they get to the moon. It turns out that it's a fucking setup and it was Hollis the yeah. whole time. And there's a bomb. And Hollis is just trying to kill all the best people that work for Runciter. And the bomb goes off. The, what quick note about the bomb, which I liked. This is these are the <laughs> details that make the books fun. Yes, is the bomb is like a guy. It's a guy, and then he slowly the... he slowly fills up like a big balloon, and everyone's like, "Oh no, he's a bomb man!" <laughs> <laughs> he's, basically, he uh, he's basically he's yeah. basically fucking. Um, he's like a cyborg. what's her name? Veruca Salt from Wa- Wa- Willy Wonka. <laughs> yeah, is she yeah. the one the blueberry that like filled up and fucking <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Or no, um, you're turning violet. Violet is violet. Violet, violet, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. violet. Um, but anyway, so then he blows up. And then, so in the uh, initial story, Runciter dies. The boss dies, but everyone else survives. They escape the moon. They go back. But then weird shit starts happening. They start, like, their money starts changing, and it doesn't work anymore in the th- shit that they have to put it in. Mm-hmm. Runciter's face starts showing up on money. Yeah. Um, like random pieces of technology start reverting to earlier states like TVs and fr- like fridges and shit like that. Yeah. And it becomes clear that there's some kind of like time fuck going on where like some things are going backwards and some appear to be going forward. Like there's coins with Runciter's face that are dated from like years in- ahead of time. Yeah. Um, and then basically it becomes clear that there's like a, a a saboteur in the midst who's like running time backwards to try to kill all of the inertials that were there. And then it turns out that maybe they're all already dead and that they're all in the, in the fucking um, frozen, basically cryogenic state. Yeah. And actually they all died, but Runciter was the only one that survived. And then he starts communicating to them 
and then there's another fucking like bad entity in there with them named Jory, Jory. who we do <laughs> who to be fair we do meet earlier in the book because he yes. he kind of hijacks She's talking to Ella. Right, he uh, kind of hijacks Runster's wife. He hijacks Runster's conversation with his dead wife at one point earlier on. So it's established. But anyway, so yeah, you can see the zigs and the zags. And basically, Joe Chip has to confront Jory. <laughs> Save the day. And, and try to, yeah. He has to put his chips on the table. <laughs> okay, God damn it. I mean, I'm surprised no one said that in the book. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, well, and that's and that's where I think that, and none of uh, that explains what U- Ubik is, which is great. So yeah, uh, yeah, and Ubik well, is we, we, referenced we in fake commercials at the top of each chapter, yes. yeah. even before the the potential cold pack uh, half life purgatory r- portion. Yes, and there's no thread between the the short snippet commercials. I would say either it's just like it sounds like it could be any commercialized item that's being advertised. Here's a here's an example just to give you an idea. Perk up pouting household surfaces with new Miracle Ubic, the easy to apply, extra shiny, non-stick plastic coating, entirely harmless if used as directed, saves endless scrubbing, glides you right out of the kitchen. There's stuff like that in at the beginning of every chapter. I got one. Wild new Ubic salad dressing, not Italian, not French, but an entirely new and different taste treat that's waking up the world. Wake up to Ubic and be wild. Safe when taken as directed. <laughs> yes. That's one of Which the, I, li- I like that. That's also one of the things that re- recurs in all those little chapter head ads. It's like, safe when taken as directed, follow instructions carefully, et cetera, et cetera. Right. The assumption, obviously, being it would kill you if you didn't. Exactly, yeah. But, the, I mean, what the what Ubik is in the story, though, is like, do we say that it's a spray can that you spray in the netherworld that keeps you alive as a half-life being? <laughs> we didn't. Sure, yeah. But that's kind yeah, that's... of... That's really what its purpose is. Or it um, keeps you, more. yeah, exactly. It, it keeps you in, it like keeps you in a specific state of time, I guess. Or health within or, your, yeah, your dying Because it also heals like, wounds in the book. Right, of your spray, spray ghost. Can. But these people are all already in the cold packs, so. I think, so one of the things I was thinking of was just like in the mirroring thing. I mean, yeah, I, th- I, I think it's pretty on the nose with how you have to pay five cents, ten mm. cents to literally do move your body through the future world of 1992. And I think I think there's a lot of obvious like commodification of the spirit and death and how even your dead body is like a fucking phone call that certain relatives have to make and they're like I better get the best for my money and then he's all pissed when Jory is hijacking his line he's like the fuck up like Jory yeah Jory uh which which Jory ends up being terrifying really he's yeah. a sc- legit scary he's yeah legit scary Jory I mean I feel like I'm just laughing this whole thing but there was I really did like a lot of the moments in this I, I thought one of the more fascinating ideas was that I mean, not an idea that I agree with, but all these people that are in this half-life state in the cold boxes or whatever, they're conscious, but they're also, like, able to communicate with each other. Right. Which I thought to be very a very strange idea. And it's unclear yeah. if you can only communicate with people around you that also went into the cold boxes at it, the same time it, you did. Uh, it or is, if you can, like... I know we memed about this early on in the episode, but it is fucking kind of like The Matrix. <laughs> yeah. Once people <laughs> lay side by side and live in a ho- jointly hallucinated reality, yeah. Right. Kind they kind of. of make it like a shared world. Like, that's the whole thing is that, like, Jory, it turns out that Jory was kind of creating this whole world actively for all these people. And, like, he reverts them back to, like, 1939 or something, right? Um, yeah. And, and, like. Or, no, he doesn't. He, it, it's the problem is he's warring with Ella. And Ella's the one who has the, like, crystal clear 1939 memories because she's actually an old person. Right, 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 right. And Jory's just, like, he's literally, like, a billionaire's fail son who died young mm-hmm. and now parasitically lives in the afterlife, too. And, and he, like, and he's eating, he eats dead people's he souls. He eats ghosts, yeah. Yeah, which is also a cool idea. If there's a one that, I mean, no one can say that Philip K. Dick doesn't throw cool ideas Dude. fast and thick at you. It's just, yes. you know. yeah. That's kind of what you're here for, I would say, more so than, um, you know, beautiful language or anything. It's 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 like, you know, how you read a lot of, like, sci-fi. It's like, 
you, if you if it's also if they're beautiful writers, that's a huge bonus. But but mostly you're there for like cool concepts being uh, elaborated on or whatever. It also reminded me of um, yeah. It also reminded me at least when it sort of becomes clear that the uh, the inertials are the ones who are kind of dead in the cold packs. It it reminded me of that Black Mirror episode, um, San Junipero, where they have yeah. the the except that's happy and this is not, um, but like it's, it's a similar of sort of thing where you're kind of like you know, in this half dead, like post life state and mm-hmm. in this like shared crafted reality. Except here it's crafted by like a psychotic like dead guy. Yeah, yeah, and I I really was thinking of Inception. A lot too, because I mean, uh, there are moments in that where people in the dreams like don't know they're dreaming, and that's kind of what a lot of the people's experiences in the corporation wa- was for like a lot of the book. They like didn't even know exactly what their predicament was until Rensiter tells Joe Chips. Um, <laughs> but there's also the. the <laughs> there's also the the thing in inception too where it's like uh if you stay in there too long you'll die which yes. is kind of in this too yes um, unless you have unless you have ubic yeah you need ubic well ubic, ubic. i mean i think it's safe to say that like uh the fucking the matrix the nolan all these people were certainly influenced right by Philip K. Dick. well i think like, i'm just yeah. trying to give him That's some more credit like, I, I was yeah, this is power. Like I was even thinking. Like I watched WandaVision recently, and there's mm-hmm. that's a great show. And there's there's moments in WandaVision where, um, like they're trying to communicate to Wanda. You find out later in the show they're trying to communicate to Wanda, whatever Spoilers. her name is, um, through like a like a thing, like an audio thing to, that comes out of a radio within the t- television show. This doesn't mm-hmm. make sense if you don't know what that show's about. But that kind of happens in this too. Like the people that communicate, like Rinsider can communicate yes. through weird means. Yeah, Rinsider, to the people that are that that was part of why yeah. his face started showing up on money and shit is because he was actually trying imperfectly through the like interference of Jory to communicate with these with his employees who were all dead and trying mm-hmm. to be you know he he shows up on like TV commercials and on posters and shit with messages and like graffiti yeah which. Yeah. I'm not sure how he does that if, you know, <clears throat> like, if you don't have a direct line, if the person isn't conjured to speak to you. Right. I don't know how he, maybe he doesn't have to try. Maybe it, reality reorients to accommodate whatever the communication is. But you know what I mean? Like, he's ha- he's writing notes in yeah. cigarette boxes and on uh, tickets that cops give people for speeding. Yes. It's, it's very, I liked it. Um but yeah, it, yeah. Obviously, it, it might be not worth it even to explain the way most of this functions. I don't know, y- you know. Well, I mean, it. Yeah, I, I think, think the, that's always a, earlier. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, like, I feel like he's really good at throwing out a lot of ideas. I don't even know if he totally knows the extent of how they all fit together. Right. You know, he's like really excited about all these things he's thinking <laughs> yeah. about. He spits them out. And he's chemically excited. That's I'm always like the excited. that's always the fine line in science fiction, right? Like here's like a bunch of like cool ideas and cool shit and like how you know, how, in 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 how much detail do I need to explain how it functions, right? Like how yeah. how in depth do I need to get about why it works the way it does? And I I mean, I actually think that Dick does have kind of a a funny like um uh meta commentary moment about that towards the end where you know oh, about how the ubic works yes where yeah. uh you know um joe it's chip like second to last page. it's like very close to the end joe chip is sort of like about to you know die because jory is kind of like overpowering him and he you know because one of the things jory is able to do is even in the that reality is like revert ubic as a as like a commercial product back to the point where it's like not useful anymore and it might actually kill you Mm -hmm. um, because it has these fucked up ingredients, which is like a commentary, which is funny because it's sort of like a commentary on like the awful shit we used to put in actual commercial products that people used. It becomes like a cream with just like straight poison in it, basically. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's like, oh, if I ingest this, I would be dead instantly. But there's this, there's this paragraph 
uh, right at the end, yeah, it's like the third or fourth to last page where, and I think this is kind of like Dick commenting. I, I, I don't know if I should read the whole thing, but it's... Um, Do it up. Okay, so this is like the, th- sci-fi, the third to last heavy. page. Um, what is... So, so uh, Joe Chip is talking to this girl that he basically has conjured to bring him more usable Ubik. What is Ubik, Joe said, wanting her to stay? A spray can of Ubik, the girl answered, is a portable negative ionizer with a self-contained high-voltage low-amp unit powered by a (laughs) peak-gain helium battery of 25 kV. The negative ions are given a counterclockwise spin by a radically biased acceleration chamber, which creates a (laughs) centripetal tendency to them so that they cohere rather than dissipate. A negative ion field diminishes the velocity of antiphotophasons normally present in the atmosphere. As soon as their velocity falls, they cease to be antiprotophasons, and under the principle of uh, parity, no longer can unite with protophasons radiated from persons frozen in the cold pack. That is, those in half-life. The end result is that the proportion of protophasons not canceled by antiprotophasons increases, which means, for a specific time anyhow, an increment in the net put-forth field of protophasonic activity, which the affected half-lifer experiences as greater vitality, plus a lowering of the experience of low cold pack temperatures. So you can see why regressed forms of Ubik failed to... And then Joe cuts in and says something. And and I kind of think that's funny because he seems to be... Um, almost because that paragraph is like oh, clearly nonsense, right? Right. Um, and he seems to be kind of sending up uh, or poking fun at the kind of like hard sci-fi people who demand like I need to know exactly how this fucking works or whatever. Um, and it it just felt a little meta to me in a in a way that I enjoyed. Yeah, because that's not what he's in the game for at all. That's not his, he's he's not a hard sci-fi guy. He's not trying to explain how like you know ion thrusters would right, work right. conceivably it's right. like you know he's not even trying to he's he's not even trying to be like Crichton where he's putting a thin patina of you know harvard uh science knowledge over fantastical stuff enough to make it feasible i, I yeah philip k dick does not give a shit about that he wants to talk about the tibetan book of the dead in this basically on some level yes and like all the cool Which shit he, he, he learned from his gurus and stuff uh and uh, well, and he'll just make up a word like protophasonic activity to describe why you can be a ghost after you die, and that's it. It's done, and you're a nerd if you want to know why. It is kind of this Chad. What, he, uh, does, it do, he does kind of have a Chad, like, oh, you want to know how this works? You're fucking loser. Yeah, you, you stop reading. You're in it for the wrong... And that's why he saves it for the end, because he's like... The, the dude, Joe Chips, has been trying to... F- Tom, fi- Tom, Tom Doritos... Tom Dorito has been trying to find out the ingredients to Ubik and what it is for Joe like. Lays. <laughs> That's a cool guy. Uh, <laughs> for a long time, to- like for like fifty pages at the minimum. The whole book, yeah, yeah. Or the whole time he's been in Afterlife, and like, and he, it's it's just funny. I think he's yeah, it's a joke. He's stringing you along, and then you finally you finally get a can of the stuff. And you get to read the label on the back like a weirdo. Yes. And he makes fun of you for wanting it, and he saves it to the end. So yep. you, that's when you can only, that's when you can get off on that. And it's, yeah, I like that. What were you gonna say, it, Paul? Oh, I found a quote of by uh, Dick's former wife Tessa on Wikipedia, where she's talking about what she claimed Dick thought Ubik was, and it's cringe. Ooh, let's go. She said, uh, Ubik is a metaphor for God. Ubik is, is all-powerful and all-knowing, and Ubik is everywhere. The spray can is only a form that Ubik takes to make it easy for people to understand it and use it. It is not the substance inside uh, the can that helps them, but rather their faith in the promise that it, it will help them. You just had to believe. I did not see that at all. I, but, I, kind I, mean, of... I, think that, I think he was a... Uh, there's pictures of him wearing like a giant cross necklace. I think that he was like. I feel like that's probably just edgy. Maybe it was just he's edgy. like a Christian mystic. Like there, there's like a psychedelic Christian kind of stuff yeah. that that has been popular for a long time, and that that's something that you could probably do. Um, well, I think that you know I, that that you know that checks out in some ways in terms of my reading of the book, and maybe we should read that that final ad for Ubik in that last chapter. Because he basically says the same thing. It's You don't even, you know. You want to read it, Matt? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Um, but I also, you know, when, when, after Matt reads it, we can talk, cause like I read it much more as like a, uh, a, a much more anti-capitalist sort of thing, frankly, as like a way of talking about like, you know, the way in which products and, and capital kind of structure our reality. And that, that also involves in really profound ways I think like faith like oh capital like this product is going to make me feel better or like this what I'm missing in my life is you know a nicer kitchen or a nicer couch or whatever and I think that's what the purpose of these like chapter heading ads are in some ways like it's ubic is actually that sort of like ethereal meaning right like it's this like it's this thing that the nicer car is promising you but doesn't actually exist yeah i mean it's it reminded me of fight club it reminded me of fight club mm. and like i am my ikea blue suede couch or whatever mm-hmm. you know what i'm talking about yeah. yeah i i thought of it that way as just like an anti obvious anti-capitalistic sentiment but yeah. i will say after you read the thing matt I did find parts of it to be like oddly pro capitalist mm. um, that I thought were kind of unintentional. But I, if you have a thing to say, read about about that. That'd be cool because I I didn't I I believe you. I just I don't I don't know. Yeah, if you, you have, have any a, quotes from that, quote, that'd be Paul, good. Oh, I don't have any quotes. I just thought I I thought that uh, Runciter acting as like the CEO kind of came across as like strangely the cowboy john wayne hero trying to save his employees mm. from this this well, the very last, death the very last page is the final zag yes. right <laughs> like because then it's like yeah <laughs> like you know but i i know what you mean it's funny that it was, we're rooting for inertials like it feels like we're rooting for the people who it feels like we're yeah like we're rooting for the people who are like trying to like put a kibosh on like cool, wild, evolutionarily interesting talents in like the new phase of humanity. Well, and, or and and Hollis Hollis, the guy who runs the other company, is explicitly characterized as having that view, right? That like you guys are holding back humanity basically right. by trying to stop us from doing this shit. Because it's it not felt quite a Magneto like, Xavier, uh, right? Because no, it felt per- like uh, what is it called when people do tech in California? Silicon Valley. Was that Silicon Valley? <laughs> <laughs> it felt like it. <laughs> they do tech. <laughs> I, I, I've been trying to suppress my giggles still. So, yeah, they're right. They're right under the surface. At least no one said S. Dole Melpone. <laughs> you can't do it. I'm having a tough enough time with inertials. It's just initials, but it's inertials. <laughs> One of the dumbest words I've ever seen. <laughs> Yeah, that is part of the problem. The words are are legitimately awkward when yeah. you you know, but. <sighs> All right, Matt. Do you want to read this final Ubik ad? Yeah, this is this is the end. This is where, and I, I think, you know, I think Ubik is. It, it it has all these manifestations as like they as time regresses into different periods of, you know, pat you know, all the way to 1939 from 1992, where like Ubik is called Ubik. And the elixir of Ubik and stuff, and and it's always like snake oil or just some bullshit, uh, uh, sort of harkening back to the the uh, these ideas of like cure alls and panaceas that people used to sell that were just like fucking, it's just you know olive oil with gold flakes in it and shit, right, and like, right. you know, j- just the idea you're, people are always trying to bottle the perfect product in happiness general, and happiness, a panacea, and like that that ends up being you know explicitly. God, I, I feel like a pretty like, yeah, uh, yeah, a, a God by the end, in a very explicitly in this little chunk right at the end of chapter seven or beginning of chapter seventeen, uh, where the, w- in place of where those like shitty ads used to be, it goes, "I am Ubik, before the universe was, I am. I made the suns, I made the worlds, I created the lives and the places they inhabit. I move them here, I put them there. They go as I say, they do as I tell them." I am the word, and my name is never spoken, the name which no one knows. I am called Ubik, but that is not my name. I am. I shall always be. Which is super, it's very biblical. Like, it's very, uh, 
like Old yeah. Testament, like you know, back in the the, the you know, like the what is the Yahweh thing? I'm, I'm, it's, I'm it's, struggling. It's, it's like the, I am. I am who am. Yes, is the, yeah. is the Yahweh like like just self description, and so it's very like it, I, it to me pretty clearly calling back to that sort of language. Jehovah starts with an I. Yeah. And ubik is also, you know, the der- derivation is ubiquitous and right. ubik meaning uh, Latin for like everywhere, every everywhere, and yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not like tenderly pl- placed in there that idea. It's like it's pretty, it's pretty in your face. It's it's very in your face, and it's it's it, I don't know. I was trying to think of like okay, so if if ubik is a spray can when you're in the half-life world and Dick's trying to say that, uh, Ubik is like consumeristic, I don't know, values or just things that you have to spray yourself with. Is that just like a direct metaphor for how you are in, when you're not in the cold pack and in the half-life mm-hmm. world? Are, like, are we just spraying each other with, uh, with a Ubik metaphorical Ubik? When we're not That's... half dead, but when we are half dead, we're using spray can. It it just seemed like it, I can kind of see what he's what he's doing, but it it feels funny to me. Mm. Yeah, it feels a little I... off and funny. There's there is a certain amounts of like, and I can't tell if I'm just basic bitch who needs like, yeah, nice nice themes rounded off and developed in a way that I like personally, but like. <laughs> yeah, the, some of these things didn't feel like they connected necessarily. Like the yeah. two segments felt lopsided in a way. There, yeah. there was too much. There was too much extra stuff that to not have been resolved. That was just kind of um, thrown in there for all the lack of world building, quote unquote. You know, there were still a lot of ideas about what the world was that they were in in nineteen in this like fake nineteen ninety two, and you know, like Gabe was saying like I think mentioned earlier, like a lot of shit just gets kind of tossed out. Yeah. And then we're just in the new part where he wants to talk. He re- he wanted to talk about cold pack and he wanted to talk about the afterlife. Uh, instead. And like, and yeah. And, and yeah, it's like the first, you know, it, it's such a fucking like skirt, skirt moment <laughs> in the book where I'm like, okay, cool. Like we're doing like corporate espionage and there's a bombing on like a, yeah. the, on the moon. Like, cool. Like I'm with it. Like, and then it just goes, like, totally, like, skirt skirts into something completely different. And I just, like, and, you know, it's not like the first part, like you said, Matt, it is lopsided. Like, it's not like the, 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 he's, it, it's half the book setting up like that, like, pulling out the rug. It happens relatively quickly. Um, yeah. But still, I was just, I just, like, ugh. It, it, it well, was, I it, couldn't it's help so, it. the whole, the, 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 the word I, I, keep coming back to in terms of describing my experience of reading this book is just jarring. It's just bit, just jarring in so yeah, many, the yeah. language, the, the pacing it's, it's, I don't know. Well, yeah, the overall plot is jarring. And then the, you know, the microcosm of the particular paragraphs and sentences are also jarring. It's just like, it throws, it throws me off left and right. And it, I really do think it comes down to amphetamines. It honestly on feels I like it. he wrote, he wrote each chunk like in a three week or three day binge and then he fell asleep for three days and then he woke up and wrote the next one and then fell asleep and then finished it. Well, he's, he's still writing like a, uh, he's still writing more in the mystery genre. It felt mm-hmm. to me overall. Like, yeah. It kind of felt noir Yes. Or yeah. Or well, like cause, a Hollywood. Cause you have those, you have yeah. uh, one, one thing that maybe we should talk about is that like, there's a, and I think that this is, maybe comes through in a bad way in the book is that this book was like pretty explicitly written with dick for dick as like this is going to become a movie right like there's a yeah. there's a screenplay version of this book that he also oh. wrote yeah um, Shit. and it's like the only one that hasn't yeah right yeah exactly which is funny and i wonder maybe maybe that is part of it but like there's clearly like those scenes where I can be like, oh yeah, he wrote this thing, envisioning how it would look in a movie. Like those scenes where, um, you know, early on when, we're, when we meet Joe Chip, he's kind of this like, you know, poor. Like <laughs> he's like he's like oh yeah he's like this poor he can't afford to he's, open his but fridge. he's but he's too smart and he wakes up hungover and he's like answering his phone like 
hey, yeah, I'm here. What do you need, man? I'm hungover and like edgy. And like you <laughs> could, I can just see Phil, like Philip K. Dick's vision of that on the screen as he's writing it in the book. You know what I mean? And there was a lot of scenes that felt that way to me. Yeah, one one scene like that including the time travel out. scenes when they go back and they're like in like 1930s Oklahoma or where or in Iowa. They're in Iowa. They're in Des Moines, I think. Yeah, right? Des Moines. Yeah, which I don't know anything about it because I live in Florida. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Yeah, the one of the scenes I was thinking that felt very Hollywood movie screenplay was when uh, Joe Chip finally meets uh, Rensiter at the end. And they're talking, and he's like, "Oh, well, it's actually this, and this is my whole plan." And a lot of exposition, yeah, so much exposition. It it was just hitting you over the head, and it felt like the end, or like close to the end of a movie, like a Mission Impossible movie or something. Runster turns slowly around in a big chair, and to reveal did, did himself. Did that actually happen? Yeah, he slowly it felt turns like it around. He's like, "Oh, he does. Oh, wow, it is me, Runster. <laughs> I am Runster. <laughs> I have a dumb name. So do you." And I think, like, but the, the part of so part of the mystery thing, like, the tropes and, and and the writing style of a mystery, murder mystery style thing, mm. mixed with like mysticism and then sci-fi, is 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 a just is a bizarre combination. And he does he is he he doesn't tell you. It's like. I get what he's trying to do, which is like wait to tell you about certain information so that you can have the cl- the mystery thing, like the almost the formulaic Edgar Allan Poe fucking origination of, of like aha moment where a bunch of things you were confused by click together and now you understand what they all mean and in and whatever and like that experience being pleasurable. Um, but he's a little clunky with that mechanic. He does it a bunch. Where you, you're not sure what's going on, and he's like, you know, people start getting old really fast, and right. there's all this time reversion, and you know, th- there's all these different inertials, and uh, that he's thrown at you who have these abilities to read your mind or alter reality and create new timelines. Yeah. So you're you're already like expecting that, and and he wants you to be confused by that, but yeah, it does just create these kind of like zoom zoom like weird, uh, yeah, jarring kind of jumps and and as much as it feels intentional it also you're you're kind of roughed up in a i would say in a little bit of an awkward or bad way i've I've said this before on the podcast and this is this is something that i that i stand by pretty this is one of my fundamental operating principles when it comes to evaluating literature or art or whatever in general just because something is the point or is intended doesn't mean it's good or enjoyable right and I think that that might be part of what's going on here. Like, you know, the, the, that disorientation, that kind of like whatever, that, that jarringness, the zigs and the zags, it, yeah. it, is, it is entirely possible that, that, that those were intended and that that was the point, but that doesn't mean it's good. Just because, you know, like, that doesn't mean that it's enjoyable to read. It doesn't mean that it's like, you know, whatever. And I think or, the, like, or that it could have been if you had just handled it differently. Sure. Also, right. right? right. Like, yeah, for sure. Not even innately, just not. It could, wouldn't be good. Like, but you know, maybe you just you're not as you don't have the depth enough touch to, to right. maybe do it as well as you think you had. Well, and I think that one of the things that I you know, <clears throat> thinking about like the fact that this was, you know, uh, I I don't know how explicitly he wrote it as a screenplay originally, but it it was pretty quickly afterwards put translated into one. Um, mm you know those moments those like filmic moments that 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 you guys have been mentioning oh the, the chair turns around it's runciter oh the bomb goes off or whatever like they should hit and they don't like they don't they none of them none of those moments yeah hit me in the kind of like oh shit like way that i felt like he wanted them to you know like when like there's a moment where um you know, uh, uh, Joe Chip kind of realizes that Pat is... So here's the thing. Could Here, here be it is. bad. Pat could be the bad. This is a, on 178 right before chapter 13. Um, this is when Runciter has been trying to signal to Joe Chip that Pat could be the bad, the villain, right? It turns out that she's probably not, but this is before we know that. Um, 
She didn't recognize the writing, Joe said to himself, because she's not familiar with it, and the rest of us are. Runciter, he said. You're doing it, aren't you, Pat? He said. It's you, your talent. We're here because of you. And you're killing us off, Don Denny, <laughs> said to her. Yeah. One by one. <laughs> <laughs> but why? And this, I, I also think the writing here is kind of weird. And you're killing us off, Don Denny said to her. One by one. But why? To Joe, he said. What reason could she have? She doesn't even know us. Not really. Is this why you came to Runciter Associates? Joe asked her. He tried, but failed to keep his voice steady. In his ears, it wavered, and he felt abrupt contempt for himself. G.G. Ashwood scouted you and brought you in. Was he working for Hollis? Is that it? Is that what really happened to us? Not the bomb blast, but you? Pat smiled, and the lobby of the hotel blew up in Joe Chip's face. And that's the end of the chapter. And I'm just like, like I know that's supposed to be like a, oh shit, like moment, and it just, it isn't. And also, did it blow up? No, he, but he was hit with the, like, getting old sickness or whatever. Okay, so it was also just, it was not meant to be taken literally. Yeah, it just, but again, it's well, like, it oh, like shit, it, it was supposed to be, oh, no, shit. No, but yeah, I know what yeah. you mean, yeah. And well, it wasn't. Fun, I mean, it wasn't at all in the moment, but also knowing that it w- didn't actually blow up made me think of, like, like a cheap cutaway to a commercial on, like, a TNT show. Yeah. Where you, like, think something horrible happens. And then he comes back, and, like, it's not as bad as he thought. Right. Right. And you're like, what? That, that, that guy, like, definitely got stabbed by that other yeah. man, though. But it's like, no, they, the- <laughs> they punched him in his leg. It, it, I don't know. Yes. It felt like it, um, Like very TV writing, like TV. commercial break yeah. writing. And even, even, yeah. the, even the end, even the ending has that quality, too, where, because oh. at the end of the book, basically it turns out that Oh shit! Maybe Runciter it is in, is yeah. is incepted too yeah. because he starts to see one of the one of the key giveaways that that the inertials were <laughs> were were dead was that they were seeing Runciter's face and shit on money and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm re- the, the third to last, the very end of the book, the third to last line. It it is uh. It was the first Joe Chip money he had ever seen. <laughs> no. But, but, no. <laughs> so basically, right, the big, the big oh shit ending is that Runciter starts to see Joe Chip on money. And that was... Joe Chip had seen Runciter on the money, and that was the yeah, sign ooh. that something was off. So it's like this whole, like, oh, it's not over, dude. Literally, the last line is, this was just the beginning. Yeah, and it's just like, oh, cool. God. It just feel like a cheesy, like, sci-fi movie. Yeah. yeah. And I guess, I, once again, maybe we have we, a, a mild appeal to the time. Yeah, yeah. And the novelty of the concepts For sure. that I guess Dick was, like, playing... But then again, when when was the Lathe of Heaven written? Oh, that, true that. That's actually a good question. I think it's or like I honestly later. was thinking of uh, of Hume's Will. I get I give Hume's Will way more respect now after reading this. Lathe, Lathe of Heaven was, was two years later, nineteen seventy one. Oh no, okay, not that crazy. And that book holds up. Hume's Will, you like it? No, he hates he, Lathe of Heaven. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. It was a joke. Um, no, I, I do give Hume's Will more. More props, though. After, well, because uh, it's a robust harsh, world but... with with a robust idea of what it's trying to say as well, you know. Whereas, like, you know, and and this is partially why Philip K. Dick is popular. Like, there, there's a certain kinship I feel to someone like Murakami, even uh, someone who's. I, I just feel like the minute you're in their prose, you know it, and it's for reasons that are not necessarily comfortable or like mm. you're, you're you're mildly put off or i am anyway as a reader by both but i find it to be mostly enjoyable although i will say that uh philip kiddick is like more hit or miss with the quality control because <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, like what would you say like 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 the controlling idea... I don't know. That's a shit... That's a dumb thing to say. No, but like, I, I don't... I mean... 
What, what was mean? what was Philip K. Dick you think excited about exploring when he wrote this? I I don't I don't really know. <laughs> like, I think I think you know. I definitely think that I mean at least the way I was reading it, the sort of like consumerism capitalist angle is part of it. But like, there's right, people like turning said, on to money at the end. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, exactly. People's identities literally being expressed on coins and shit. Like. But but there's so much else going on. Like the, the, yeah. they go back in time, and the dude is like trading old cars for flights and planes, and then thinking about racism in the, the '30s, and like right. There's, there's like a weird Star Trek moment where he's like, "I forgot about racism." Yeah, Man. there's just like so much. Well, I think there's also a big fixation. I think that being cryogenically frozen was a kind of a new thing in like the 60s right i don't know that was that was a new idea i think that was a big aspect of this of this too disney I was think frozen probably... right or is still is he still? i know that is that really true he want he think that, requested uh, to be elon musk who's that ted williams was i think ted williams head is frozen i think that might really? be a futurama thing <laughs> you're probably right but i think that maybe his body is too but maybe futurama to took it from a real thing I think Nixon is on a spider robot in a tank. Oh, that's well, definitely I, I, Futurama. <laughs> I do think that I think he had a fixation about this, the sci-fi idea of cryogenics, though. And I think he was exploring that and what that means for your consciousness. I, I mean, and I, yeah, I think Matt, you're right. Like he was definitely in the in the, you know, uh, the headspace of like spiritualism and like body versus spirit and like how can the mind be preserved after he body talks about, death and blah blah. He blah. talks about the plate. He talks. We've talked about this before, but he again references directly like platonic forms and, yeah. uh, you know, in 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 a world created in you know a void world a bardo that you're sort of living in created of 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 thought forms and memories like yeah just like are these manifestations of the platonic forms and therefore i'm seeing the perfect platonic form of a uh a, a, you know a, a firebird or something whatever they're right. driving around uh yeah it's very strange yeah i <laughs> yeah i wasn't I wasn't sold on his Plato exegesis, per, frankly, like that. I wasn't, I wasn't sure that he was using it, those concepts correctly. Yeah. But yeah, he, he does reference it. He, it just feels like someone who's like, yeah, uh, cracked out of their mind and reading stuff. Like, this is shit's cool. This is fucking this is sweet, cool. Dude. Fuck, dude. And like, what if ideas are real? What if ideas and just stuff are like this? fucking real? I mean, I, there's, there is some interesting stuff about. Murakami. Um, Murakami. <laughs> <laughs> Killing Commendatory, the idea made real. <laughs> the evil double metaphor. <laughs> the double metaphor. <laughs> Why is the double metaphor that bad? I don't understand. Right, I know. It sounds like a cooler metaphor. Yeah. It just, yeah, yeah Don, it's like a metaphor. Don Denny too. is a double metaphor. <laughs> Don Denny. <laughs> Everyone had a fucking Milwaukee accent in my imagination, hey, too, Don the whole Denny. time. We're yeah. really going to go to Luna? We're going to go to Luna, huh? Oh. I yeah. can't believe you guys lost track of S. Dole Melipone. <laughs> S. Dole Melipone. I just opened the page and I see Sammy Mundo. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he came up with them while he was writing the book. Like it was like, okay, that guy's Sammy Mundo. Sammy Mundo. Sammy Mundo. Yeah, but statistically, they shouldn't all be this funny. Yeah. Yeah. If you were even making it up. I know. I, well, and wasn't there one girl thing. that had, her last name was, like, actually Spanish? Like, the yeah, way? Yeah, it was, uh... Yeah, French-Spanish or something? It's <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Dude, it literally was something like that. Francine uh, Spanish? Francine Spanish or something. <laughs> I forget the... I forget the lack that. of I effort remember. is just hilarious. Well, and it's it's funny. I was like, because I was like... And even, <laughs> even the... Even the... Even the fucking... The... Wall Street guy, Stanton Mick. <laughs> that sounds rude. It doesn't sound like a real name. Uh, no. Even it's, yeah, I never even realized names like mattered so name. much. It's so weird. They it's really just so do. weird. Also, it, did you pay attention to their descriptions of everyone's outfits? Yes. 
everyone's wearing the craziest clown shit. Yes. <laughs> it's like moo-moos with high top sneakers and kangle hats and like yes. elbow length yes. gloves. I'm yes. like, what the? F-? And it, yeah. And insane. French Spanish just has like a fucking <laughs> leopard print like onesie. <laughs> leopard print onesie. Yeah. <laughs> just like knee high boots with like fucking fish in the heel. Yeah. 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 Um, it, it is hard. It's. I think it's hard for me to like separate. When was this written again? 69. 69. Published in 69, yeah. And that's, Summer you know, when was the uh, original Star Trek introduced? That was in the 60s. The first I don't know. one? It's a good question. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe, yeah, I don't know. So, I, I don't know. I'm trying to put my mind, I can't obviously put my mind in that time period, but We're thinking talking about, about Star shift. Trek and how colorful it was and just, like, people. people's idea of sci-fi was just so, like, Grandiose and things are just going to change and alter in forty years. And right, it's freaking space and. My mom always you know. makes the joke because she's a Trekkie of like, the advanced civilization, the F- Galactic Federation out to bring peace and equality and uh, paradise to all these races. And at, at the end of the day, a lot of the time, Kirk just has to take off his shirt and have a knife fight with like a lizard guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's like, why TNG is planet. so much better. Um, I mean, because we're talking about, uh, and again, you know, like, you know, maybe some people will be reading at me, uh, but like, there's there's the silver, no, there's the different ages of sci-fi. There's like the silver age. They do this with comics too. Like uh, Mm -hmm. the golden age is is like the first one, and I feel like we're we're this. Like Philip K. Dick and Co. like represent a sort of transitional period uh, into the Silver Age or whatever. Like n- essentially the next generation of like uh, mm-hmm. sort of like uh, s- uh, speculative fiction writers uh, who have been affected by a lot of like the cultural turns of the po- you know of the '60s, uh, like growing up in the '50s and seeing the '60s emerge and then mm. writing about it. And then also, I, I feel like. Uh, Dick was influenced a lot by Hollywood and just his the idea of his books turning into movies too, which yeah. in a way living that, like, in San Francisco. Because I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back to like other kind of horror sci-fi stories we read around Christmas. What was it? Uh, Dickens, The Great the God Pan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and... I mean, those freaking those are no, they're not cringe at all. Um. <laughs> awesome good sci-fi um so yeah maybe there is something to be said about the the 60s and the transition period that made this a little awkward for me to read they're also reflection i mean i think yeah it's it's through the conduit of philip k dick and i think that's the main thing yeah because mostly you know even the great god pan and stuff they're all they're all pretty clear um you know once you break it down just like preoccupations of the time right you know what I mean? Yeah. Just but like the, those, those, those stories, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I endorse this comparison fully, but oh, I mean, yeah, those, it's, those it's loose those stories were yeah. also. I mean, they were they were like this in the sense that they were also like really fucking hallucinatory and abstract. Specifically, True, yeah. the white white people, I felt yeah. was like very like. There, there's entire pages in that book that are like fucking this kaleidoscopic insanity, and there's parts of like in that in this book that are well done, but much more thematically focused and much more sort of like, yes, I don't know, like I felt like there was so 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 much in this in this book, and like even just going back to something that we were talking about a minute ago, you know, thinking. T- about like him writing this as potentially like a future movie or something at the beginning, like, cause I'm a, I'm a fucking, I'll just put my cards on the table. I'm a bitch. I'm a sucker for a fucking crack team, dude. I love yeah. a good crack team. And at the yeah, beginning, dude. and at the beginning of this book, it was like some Avengers shit. It was like, oh, we're gonna get fucking French Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get Pat Conley, get the Pat. most, which which also makes me laugh because it's the most normal name ever. Like he just yeah. totally gave up with that one, dude. We got French Spanish, we got Pat Conley, we got Al fucking whatever, we got all these fucking. We all, got Gigi Wentworth. <laughs> we got. <laughs> We're not getting we Jory. Got, fuck Jory. Get, no, fuck Jory. Fuck. No, they're Dole fighting Mellab- Jory. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Honestly, fuck Mondays and fuck we got, S. Joel we got, we got, what, what Wasn't there a guy named like Tito Andronicus or something? <laughs> That would be too cool. No, there was. There was a Tito or something, wasn't there? You're right. You're right. Yes. But like it was. But then he had like a Greek last name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like Anthropopopus. Or yeah, something. yeah. But like I'm like, oh, cool. We're gonna have all these different characters, and they're they all have different strengths, and they're gonna come together and solve the beat the villain. What with everyone psionic using their fucking strengths for a purpose, and none of them mattered. None of those characters mattered at all to the story in no. any fucking way, except Pat maybe. Arguably, and there was this sense that maybe that we Not should. Word. <laughs> Meet Zoe Wirt. <laughs> Starring Meet David Joe Spade. <laughs> Meet Joe Black is Meet Zoe Wirt. <laughs> no, I, was thinking, I was thinking Joe Dirt. Joe Dirt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh God. Uh, yeah, because there is this sense also that there's there's the other thing that is not the mo- the thing that might be the least earned. Is uh, this notion that we, we have any connection to all these goofy ass names we've read? Because there's like suddenly we need to feel like the tragedy of their deaths, right? Yeah, uh, they all get picked off yeah. one by one, and I'm like, I care about that. What happens to the fucking Avengers? Because I love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if the Falcon fucking gets because I've seen in love with them. I'm in love with them. Well, no, honestly, there's way more characterization in the fucking Avengers movies than there are of these characters in this book. To be fair, they've yeah, had I mean, hundred years of. I know, I know, I know, but I know, I know, I know. yeah. But yeah. It, it was it was a weird thing for me though. It was like you're in this corporate world that he set up, and the the names just sounded like coffee or like water cooler names to me. Yeah, like oh, John Ashboy has Joe died I, in the explosion. <laughs> Joe and Dirt. I, like, <laughs> and I just guys, didn't hear really anyone. I just laughed at them. It was really weird. There was like fifty names in this move in this book. <laughs> It's and, names you would uh, see in your company's phone directory, and yes. you're like, "Oh, his uh, his wife actually passed away," and you're like, "Ah, it sucks. I don't care." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've never seen him. And I wanted, I, I like, I felt like there was. It felt like he started the book like four times and just didn't ch- and like just kept going. Like he didn't change any of the beginnings. I'm like, oh, this book could have been about. Could have been about all oh, these people trying to track down S. Dole Melipone. Like, that could have been the whole book. It really could have been. And I, yeah. I, I would have read that book because S. Dole Melipone seems like a badass. <laughs> and I kind of want to, like, see what his deal is. And, like, I'm just, I'm just picturing, like, Al Capone and, like, a Dole, like, uh, he ice does cream sound like cone. A mafia. <laughs> just Al Capone with a fucking, like, um, like uh, whatever with the spinning fucking beanie hat, <laughs> <laughs> with the rocket boots on because it's a future. Like a, rocket yeah. boots and like a hemp shirt, whatever bullshit we're doing. <laughs> like, like that could have been a story, right? Okay, the whole book could have been about these fucking people tracking down S. Dole Melipone. The whole book could have also been about them actually doing this mission on the moon. It could have been about like Hollis it, it, and like Hollis and, like, and what the deal is with or Jory or Pat or like it feels like there was so much. Shit. Yeah, I mean the the, the and it, it, and, wasn't like, and it was just not there. It was like thirty or twenty pages left in the book when Jory came back, right? And it was legitimately scary. Like he eats your freaking soul when you're in the half life. Yeah, ghost Jory room. is creepy, and he's like a little kid, and he has like they describe him. I think he Best was like GG GG Ash Ashwood, but he like turned back. He turned into Jory. It's he weird. can take he, different forms. He can like be whoever he wants to in the world. I mean, right. it's, it's but cool his shit. pure form is like a kid. But he like everything's wrong about his face, right? So like he descri- like uh, Dick describes his chin as like just not being quite in the right place or something. Or it's got and a that, deep cleft in it, like someone hit it with an axe or something. Yeah, yeah, and it made me just wonder, like you know, why why is he like that? What the hell happened? Does eating and, your like, soul is kind of like eating a Horcrux? Well, because I was thinking about this just because, like, the the meager parallel I could draw between, like, the two, like, I think, Runciter and Associates, Prudential Associates or whatever, and, uh, you know, it is, like, the counterforce to whatever Hollis is doing, and there being some sort of dichotomy between that kind of... Because that's the whole reality of the quote-unquote real world we mm-hmm. get for, like, the first, the, whatever that one-third of the book segment is. And then they're fighting just the opposite force. And there's no real clear reason why. I mean, it's, it's you know, you got the arguments about 
how psionics would be like a huge danger to humanity. But so you just basically have two forces canceling each other out. And then I, I, I just like, I feel like it was that time period where like he literally could be like, it's like yin and yang, man. You know what I mean? Because then there's like literally a good and evil force in the like <laughs> nether realm that they live in, right? Which is like, Ella and Jory, right? Is that what right. it's supposed to be? Yeah, yeah Ella and Jory. Like, uh, because Jory's like, he, they're like, oh, there's a per- there's an entity like this in every moratorium. Like, uh, some minority of people like have this capability of being of eating souls and keeping themselves alive, like some weird parasite. Uh, in these moratoriums that no one really talks about it. Uh, and Jory doesn't just like, so I just, I thought, you know, that was the, that was my really like superficial trying to connect the dots. Like you have a light and dark force basically battling in the netherworld. And then you just have these like, in the, in the reality of the real world, there's really just these two corporations that just fight to cancel each other out. And they, there's a nullity in yeah. what they actually do. Right. Like, it's just which, according to I keep mean, the status quo, paper, which seems like it sucks. On paper, though, it's, I mean, to me, that's like a, if you can do that, like, merge those two ideas together, which I, which was what he was trying to do, that's, I feel mm-hmm. like that's freaking cool. Like, I, it's a cool idea, mm. but I think a lot of the reason I, regardless of the names, the, the writing, the actual writing style, yeah, and just the plot in general, um, just kind of, it, it reverted from the ideas actually hitting hard for me. Um, I was too distracted, and yeah. I also think he was too distracted. I think he branched out too far away. It's it kind of remi- I mean, not totally because it is so long, but people talk about the the book it as uh, a book that is like the typical book of doing that, like having too much packed in to what could have been a more simple, straightforward horror story. Yeah, um, and this is a short book, but it does it did kind of have that vibe for me. It's just like. Yeah, too many ideas were spinning out of his head. It's culminating so... into like a cosmic spiritual ending too, right? Even yes. Like, <laughs> which it felt cringe though too to me. Like it did. Feel the book cringe. or the movie. The final chapter, of just the, the heading oh, yeah. of the final thing, and yeah, and just like that, it was like the last zag was like this is about spirituality, <laughs> right? And actually, <laughs> and, and it's too back. much. And, yeah, this is spiritual. <laughs> I, I, I thought, like, I also thought, like, and we haven't really talked about this yet, but, like, the, speaking of Stephen King, I forget what his time travel book is about the Kennedy assassination or whatever, but there's oh, yeah. there's some time travel sort of interesting stuff in this book about when, you know, uh, Joe Chip is, like, going back and trying to, like, navigate fucking 1940, early 1940s, late 1930s Iowa, and, like, oh, are we going to... Or get involved in the war and he's like yeah we're gonna enter on this date and do this and da 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 and like the racism right. stuff and there's some interesting like points made about like joe and other people who are there like knowing terms that they shouldn't know like like and i thought that it was sort of an interesting commentary about like how our our subjective experiences are shaped by culture like it's almost like it, it, it almost seems like there's a point there about like you know, in the, in this one that I'm looking at, he's Joe's talking about like, uh, like a J N training plane, and that he somehow knew that the term Jenny was a, a like a colloquial way of referring to that type of plane, right? And that's not something that he would know in the '90s, but it's it's almost like as if like being in a time period or in a culture or in a context is sort of grants you access to some of that reality. Like it's, it, it's like our, our self understandings are shaped by the contexts that we're in. I don't know. I just thought that was kind of an interesting, like little detail. It was, it isn't a, it was like an aside though. Cause it was both right. Like you, you just sort of get ambi- the ambient collective unconscious, uh, right. which is certainly an idea. I feel like Dick was plugged into as, as, as real. Um, and then also though, like right, the the flip side, which is that they know all this shit, and that they're like, oh, I actually, I'm so modern in comparison that it it would be actually kind of unlivable to know everything that's going to happen and have all these expectations and this like conception of things. Like it, it would be hell, actually. Like I would be run out of town and unhappy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a combo. But um, the, <clears throat> the harsh stupid critic in me though was at the end of the book I was thinking back to that scene 
or those scenes, and I was thinking, like, well, didn't Jory create this entire world, though? Like, yes, this isn't did. actually the past. So, right. Well, first of all, well, but it's also all Jory with, but also in kind of like tension with Ella, right? And Ella does have memories of that far back. So, it is unclear, kind of, though. It is unclear. And you don't, you don't really know how old Jory is either. Jory's like riffing off of Ella's much clearer memories, but he's not as good or something. But so he's he also like, like more up. in control somehow. Yeah. Which and also just trying makes to the check whole out. scenario like confusing to me too. Is like uh, when Chip was talking to like some racist woman about there was like a really racist, overtly racist scene that I can't totally remember right now. The taxi driver Embry- guy. Maybe it was that. Who said but they were the talking N-word about like, Jews like oh, yeah, the and N-word. like how Hitler isn't that bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah that was the taxi driver. So okay. he took it too but, far, I mean, maybe, but you know. <coughs> I don't he know. literally I think, says I think, the I think Jewish question. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about it too much, but I was just thinking at the end of the book, I was like, well, was that either Ella or Jory only that was like speaking through this character? Well, there is and a whole like, um, it feels a lot, a lot like the modern day notion that comes into like fucking Rick and Morty and, and all this kind of shit that people love, which is like the simulation. Right. Right. Where there's like NPCs and there's like uh fucking like, lag and fucking uh clipping and and uh and all this kind of shit that goes on where you can't render things fast enough so you turn around and like a house will appear because it renders whenever you look at it uh all those ideas were kind of being touched on just not in reference to vr or any sort of simulation it was like did did dick was he involved with waking life the movie did he because when i when i google him waking life pops up that movie probably just because of Scanner Not Darkly. involved, but I mean, like, is is did something he write was it was it based on something he wrote? He, maybe he's got a quote in there, but I feel like it's maybe just probably connected to uh, you know what's his face, Linklater, Linklater, because he did Scanner Darkly. Yeah, right. It's that's Sorry, Richard Linklater, just... right? That movie. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um. I have a passage that I could read that I, because I was trying to find like stuff that I liked writing wise. Yeah. Because so much of it was, <clears throat> but anyway, th- th- this was a passage when <laughs> Al, um, before Al dies, but when he's like kind of seen the omen of his death, like that old elevator, it, like it, w- 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 that is from the like 20s or whatever. And that's kind of like what triggers he's like about to die. Um, so this is on uh, 125, and it's a little long, but I think this is this was this was cool. And there's some okay, there are some weird, again, it, it's good writing, but there's also like weird ass fucking concepts that are brought up a couple times that don't come back up ever, like about the like being rebirthed into different wombs, and there's like an there's like a uh, insinuation That's that the, the, Tibetan that, book of the, that dead, the yeah. color of the womb is ma- matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is Al talking. Uh, now he became aware of an insidious seeping cooling off, which at some earlier and unremembered time had begun to explore him, investigating him as well as the world around him. It reminded him of their final minutes on Luna. The chill debased, uh, the, chill debased the surfaces of objects. It warped, expanded, showed itself as bulb-like swellings that sighed audibly and popped. Into the manifold open wounds, the cold drifted all the way down into the heart of things, the core which made them live. Up, oh, you're you you cut off. You've muted. Oh, sorry. Hello. Never mind. Where was I? The bubble. Uh, say bubbles popped, or you were at uh, what he saw now seemed to be a desert of ice. You're right there. Okay, um, the the chill debased surfaces of objects it warped, expanded, showed itself as bulb-like swellings that sighed audibly and popped into the manifold open wounds the cold drifted all the way down into the heart of things, the core which made them live. What he saw now seemed to be a desert of ice from which stark boulders jutted. A wind spewed across the plains which reality had become. The wind congealed into deeper ice and the boulders disappeared for the most part and darkness presented itself off at the edges of his vision. He caught only a meager glimpse of it. But, he thought, this is projection on my part. It isn't the universe which is being entombed by layers of wind, cold, darkness, and ice. All this is going on within me. 
and yet I seem to see it outside. Strange, he thought. Is the whole world inside of me, engulfed by my body? When did that happen? It must be a manifestation of dying, he said to himself. The uncertainty which I feel, the slowing down into entropy, that's the process, and the ice which I see is the result of the success of that process. When I blink out, he thought, the whole universe will disappear. But what about the various lights which I should see, the entrances to new wombs? Where, in particular, is the red, smoky light of fornicating couples, and the dull, dark light signifying animal greed? All I can make out, he thought, is encroaching darkness and utter loss of heat, a plane which is cooling off, abandoned by its sun. Like, that, that's, that's great. really good. That's great. <laughs> that's really great. Like, as, especially, like, as a description of, like, death, it just hit me. It gave, it, that, that gave me goosebumps. Like, that made me creeped out. I think we're. I think uh, the thing that you know, I, I, I've, I said this a bunch of times. I don't have anything to add to it, but I, I know that like, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which I think is referenced, you know, outright in the book itself, mm -hmm. uh, by title, um, seems to be like, the big inspiration, at least for the like, intermediary zone sort of yeah, purgatory segment. Um, so, so there might also just be a lot of that floating around in there that we're not picking up on. Uh, if there are like any Tibetan Book of idea. the Dead podcasts out there, <laughs> hit us up. Hit us up. I wanted to read something about Jory because um, he is he is the name is so dumb, but he is so creepy, and somehow the name yes for being so silly makes him scarier. That's true. Yeah, I was, I was thinking kind of, about. Was, yeah, go ahead. Oh, do you guys remember the Rugrats episode where there's a, the really big baby? Yes, dude. <laughs> All I was seeing was that, but with big teeth. Yes. Holy shit, that's creepy. That's terrifying. I was picturing more like, a, like an evil Pinocchio type character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That too. Where are you going? Yeah, uh, that's, how I re that's how I read his voice. Oh, I eat them. I eat their souls. They make me last longer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to eat yours next. Wow. So I like this because, like, he finally, you know, he gets the jury is like admits to, the, you know, it's it's me the whole time. And, he you know, uh, and he's kind of describing his M.O. Mask off jury. Yeah. Just freaking sicko mode. <laughs> uh, and and Joe Chip is like, why? Why is there a hotel? Why maintain a hotel? <laughs> he's like, why do all this stuff? And Jory is just like his just a Jory's eyes widen, but I always do it this way. And just like he's like a simpleton. Yes. And then Joe's like Joe threatens to kill him and he tries to fight him. And then this is where you realize that when Jory eats you, he like literally does. Yeah. He yeah. bite he 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 bites your body and eats you up. <laughs> and it just and this is the way it was described and I thought it was really gross. And this is probably partially made better by the build up, but um Snarling, Jory bit him. The great shovel teeth fastened deep into Joe's right hand. They hung on as, meanwhile, Jory raised his head, lifting Joe's hand with his jaw. Jory stared at him with unwinking eyes, snoring wetly as he tried to close his jaws. The teeth sank deeper, and Joe felt the pain of it throughout him. He's eating me, he realized. <laughs> you can't, he said aloud. He hit Jory on the snout, punching again and again. Uh, and damn you, Jory bubbled, working his jaws sideways like a sheep's grinding Joe's hand until the pain became too much for Joe to stand. Yeah, it's just like... That's it's like... It's gross, he's going to bite you. And yeah, you. and some of those, well, uh, some of those like, descriptions are clearly amphetamine descriptions. Like, shovel teeth? That's, <laughs> that is clearly a drug description. Yeah. Well, isn't there a line, too, where he says that if... He opens if Jory opens his mouth, you can hear the voices of the people he's yes, eating in there. Yes, that, that was creepy so the creepy, fuck out. dude. Yeah, that was good. creepy. Da thank you for remembering nothing that. worse yeah. than being eaten alive, but then you are alive still in the belly. That's no, that the shit true was creepy nightmare. as fuck. Yeah, he was like, "Do you want me to open my mouth? You can hear." <laughs> he just like, and then the way yeah. he just like he offers, he's like, "If I open my mouth, you can listen. If you want to listen, you can hear all the voices in there. It's like your friends are the re most recent. They're probably the loudest." Yeah, it's, it's like, so, like matter yeah. of fact. That's scary. Yeah. So uh, Jory is Jory. Yeah. 
And it's Joker it's Corey. the Joker. Well, like <laughs> the end, like Ella Glenn Runster's wife, right? She's the one who she's somehow through some sort of a, a you know union pact with the other <laughs> half dead people. Uh, extracted like the uh, you know primordial essence of creation to create a uh, product version called Ubik that they use to keep themselves alive. Somehow it's unclear wh- how that works uh, in this eternal battle of light, light and dark. But then she wants to go get reborn again, so she just she just pieces out and she's like, Joe, you're you're already here. Do you mind like fighting Jory? Over. Can, do you want to just can yeah. you fight Jory for eternity while I leave? <laughs> And that's kind of how his shit ends, and then it's then there's that twist at the very end. Some of those, uh, I, some of those descriptions at the end of Joe, like I thought those were that was actually pretty strong. Like him, because Ella kind of presents herself because she died young, I think, right? Yeah, like, she was like twenty two. Yeah, yeah, and so she presents herself in the afterlife as kind of this young girl, and he's like wants to take her to dinner, and she's like, "Dude, oh, by the way, I'm Ella. Whatever, get the Ubik." And and th- th- those were some. I thought those were some good moments, like Joe waiting at the bus stop and like yeah. getting the Ubik in the package and like, I don't know, like. It's it's but it but it's also sort of like, um, I wanted to know more. I know Jory's kind of like we're memeing on Jory, but I kind of wanted to know more about Jory. Like, why is why did Jory in death turn into this like evil soul sucking entity? Like, there's no real explanation of that. That's that's where I wonder if that no. Tibetan Book of the Dead stuff is being directly used here to create parallels. Like, if there's some sort of fucking thing in that that eats you before you. That's cross called over like or Jora or something. Yeah, exactly. And Ella is like Ila or the life force, well, or you know what I mean, even, like that kind of thing. Even regardless of that, though, like e- even if we knew that, I I still think Jory isn't in the story enough. Like I can't remember if I finished yeah. my thought earlier, but I, Jory comes into the story like in the beginning for a, a blip, and then he comes back like the last twenty or thirty pages for a bit. Mm-hmm. And I would have loved if he was more intermixed within there. I agree. I actually because yeah, I, he's fascinating. I wanted to know and more about even, Jory as a villain. And that's yeah, that's I where do like the idea of just like a, a organic child, like turning into this like blob like evil force eating souls in the nether world it's cool um but you don't really get that um, inf- much information about how old he is or, you know i, I think like there is mystery, something but, uh, about like an entity that like you know you, you get this kind of with like poltergeists right like ghosts that don't that don't want to finish their business on earth. And so they stick around for too long and they basically become malevolent. Like, I think there is something like that going on here with like, you're supposed to want to be able to pass through the different colors, signifying the different like phases of being a ghost because this is all about rebirth. And then you find the womb, you find a new womb and you're recreated. And like the people that don't want to do that and just keep themselves in place, become like distorted and turned into like, demons basically he's he's basically like it 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 also reminds i was thinking of him as like damien from the omen yeah as just like this fucking creepy just fucking soul eating kid yeah yeah legacy of kane yeah soul reaver soul reaver (laughs) (laughs) great game dude underrated really good and yeah but I, i know what you mean about like wanting more of that i i Again, I know it's it's always tough to say, you know, to give writing tips to a book that's literally world's 100 most famous I know. sci-fi okay, books of that's all time. Like, no, not okay. even. Not, dude, I, I was like, I what are we fa- missing? I soy-faced. I soy-faced when I read that. <laughs> not, like, not, re- I, not sci-fi, Matt. This is up on the one cover. Of times. Time Magazine's 100 best English language novels. That's what wild to me. And and we and they got the and they got the blurb from Adam Gopnik at the New Yorker, a masterpiece, beautiful. Which and is, hallucinatory. I, I feel like we've we've feel read like another quote by by Adam Gopnik on another book. I think Probably. it was Holbeck. 
I actually think it was Hollaback. Oh, well, that makes sense totally then, because apparently he likes bad books, if he likes Hollaback. <laughs> oh, I think we've decided on our score range at this point. Just kidding. Yeah. Wait. No, 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 no. Alan no, no, no. Slopnik, more like it. <laughs> no, no, no. Hollaback's <laughs> bad, but... But, I, I mean, I Come agree, on. though. Like, 100 yeah. best English... Like, I would say that 95% of the books we've read on this podcast are better than this book. I feel like Not I'm as a gaslit. giveaway for my score. <laughs> I feel like that. I feel like that. That is gaslighting me. Like I feel crazy <laughs> yeah. reading that. Yeah, I feel a little crazy too. <laughs> like what? Well, I yeah. I just like I must I stare be missing at it. Like something. what are you talking I must about? Be missing is that a typo? Really obvious. Yeah. Is that a hundred thousand best? Is, did they did they miss th- two three zeros in a comma? <laughs> Yeah, it's like I, I I read a nice pulp, you know, a little pulp sci-fi story. I didn't read, you know, with some uh, a, a canonical work of right. uh, English literature. I didn't and read the with, Great Gatsby with, with with some. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, the Great Runciter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was so like, weird. I just yeah, I felt I definitely felt gaslit reading all the praise for this book. And yeah, and I think well, I just I even think, like yeah, even thinking about the like I I don't know I read uh, a scanner darkly when I was seventeen I don't remember it but I remember I remember enjoying it more at at, at that time than I enjoyed this one and uh, androids I didn't love but I enjoyed it this one felt like way more disjointed than the ones that I've read before I would place this as. And, as one of those things that I would chalk this up a bit also to like this shit would probably be way more mind blowing 17 or younger. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, I do think there is something to be said for this idea that, you know, now obviously they're like children's books and shit where it's like, no, this is for a baby, but like, you know what I mean? Like that sort of preteen young adult, but well, like yeah, not, I mean, not the stupid young adult, but like you know, like it's the stuff that's like fuck. I have not encountered the concept of like platonic forms yet. I'm I'm 15. This is interesting, like, right? Uh, where you know you're 30, and you're like I'm conf- I don't know. I'm confused. <laughs> this, well, yeah, this I, I can imagine scam. being. Yeah, I can imagine being 16 and 17 and reading the last line of this book, even and just being like. This was just the beginning, and it would be. It would kind of be like in 1969. It would be like, um, the end of the Matrix, which is when when Neo is talking on the phone to (laughs) the robots. That's right. I forget what he says, but he says something similar and hangs up and then flies away. And flies away. And then uh, cue Rage Against the Machine. Rage Against the Machine. Right. A 17 year old watching that. Right. I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. So I, maybe if you read this at the same time period in 1969, 100%. It would be just like that kind of moment. And whatever yeah. the equivalent of Rage Against the Machine would come on on your the record. Grateful player. Dead. <laughs> the Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead. Oh, my uh, God. Yeah. I, I, I think what I was trying to talk about earlier before we got sidetracked into the fact that it's considered by by the New York Times so you know at this point right everybody New York Times take it with a grain of salt not the Basic not the, pap- not the paper point, of record it used to be yeah yeah um but was just that like i i feel like his dedication to remain retaining the mystery elements after the deaths of everybody went on for too long. And I, I know that's like the the slippery slope thing we talk about, you know, when, when discussing how long something should be or pacing or whatever. But again, I, you know, I'm, I'm more in the camp of like these things do have structures and stuff that are effective. And like you wanted more jewelry and you probably should have gotten it yeah. uh, because he probably should have given up. I don't know, like the, the whole guise of it being a mystery where we need to figure out who's murdering our friends, and it's like set in like the 1930s or whatever. Iowa. Uh, I could have just done with like <clears throat> them exploring the oddities of living in you know in the in you know in the Bardo, the the between 
death and life state and not so much needing to keep up the pretense of like a murder mystery or just do the weird time travel murder mystery like do, pick one or, or the just other pick a right thing, yeah, pick a yeah. Thing. yeah 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 because like i that would have i would have been cool with that too like you know that that in, and in some ways, that's kind of what I wanted. I was like, oh, my God, this is going to be a fucking crack team, and they're going to be thrown into this weird situation, yeah, and they're yeah. all going to have to use their powers to get out of it. And that doesn't happen. Like, no no one else matters except for Joe Chip and Jory <laughs> and and Runciter, basically, and Pat. And it does, and it does feel not like a subversion so much as just Pat like a like. ADHD of some sort. Or yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Right. It's not like, ooh, he's he's frustrating you like in the way we kind of concluded about killing commendatory on some level where right. it's like it even if it's not well, intentional it still rolls in with the themes. It's like, no, I think he just was distracted by how many cool thoughts he was having. Yeah. I think the one thing that interested me is that I think uh I will read the minority report by him cuz I mean this I don't think we talked about it too much, but there's a lot of similar uh, ideas that spawned out of that book like people like the yeah. minority report there's precogs obviously and there's also people that like get put into like a cryogenically frozen like i don't know what you call it but like a like a pod and they're in this sort of nether world just like frozen in time yeah um so it felt to me like he wanted to expand on some of the ideas that he had in that story and i really like that movie i it's like a freaking fun Sci-fi movie, Tom Cruise in it. It's a when you have classic. movies like Tom Cruise in them, you can't, you can't lose. <laughs> you can't <laughs> lose. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've never read that one. And Tim I, Heidegger, I'm come still on the willing. Show. Yeah, Tim, come on. I was on. Gabe and I were on a Zoom call with you. Yep. If you remember our faces, if you're watching, certified. Sure does. Certified fans. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe his work as as a whole, like in that macro of a scale, like he explores all the stuff more thoroughly. I really want to read Valus because I think that's supposed to be like some acronym for like the God entity. He ended up conceiving as the truth about reality or something like that. It, it, it felt pretty, it could be pretty fun. Is that, that's not like the most fun thing to read next I, of his. Th- it, it, it's definitely a, a situation where I, <laughs> Similar to, and I didn't, I didn't dislike this book as much as I liked uh, Submission, but, but it's a similar vibe where I'm like, I didn't really like this, but it increased my desire to read more by this author somehow. And it's, it's an interesting situation to be in. Yeah. Where you're like, yeah, oh, I think, can I please have another? Yeah, like, yeah. right. <laughs> like, well, it made me like speculative on why this one is hit one of his most famous ones. I know. And I think part of it might yeah. be because Dum Dums like the Hollywood aspects of it. Mm. May- maybe that adds to it, is people like those sort of twists and turns. The zigs um, and the zags. The zigs and yeah, the zags. Yeah. And maybe that adds to the <laughs> popularity of it. I don't know. But, yeah, I've, I'm walking away thinking that I would – I want to read, like, maybe his least popular one. Mm. It kind of reminds so me of, many. of The Miner. Uh, the minor was that I forget Natsume Soke, Sosuke. Sosuke, yeah, Sosuke. Sosuke yeah, Sosuke. that was one of his Sosuke. like, at least his personal, like least favorite novel or one that he kind of shook off as like not a real work. I don't know. It made me. It, yeah, I'm just saying it did want. It makes me want to read other things by him still, because there's enough. There's enough there. There's forty. You, I forget what, what we said. Forty two. Forty five. Forty five novels, which means that like, if you really think about it the vast minority of his books are actually popular. Right. It's exactly. something I would say, I would say if I'm being generous, it's something like 10 that yep. most people reference. And so, yeah, there's 35 fucking novels out there that are potentially better and underrepresented. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm definitely with you. I want to, I want to check out all that stuff. If it's like in print, even that's the other thing is that you can't, it's hard to keep, I mean, Philip K. Dick is probably popular enough that you can keep most of his works in print and still make money, but yeah, probably yeah, not all I'm, of them. It's like Simonon, no. man. You start to pr- make that many books and start, you start to get into the Simonon territory. Yes, like, dude. Sci-fi Simonon. Everyone's like, damn, fuck. All of this needs to be in print? <laughs> <laughs> dude. Yeah, exactly. Although well, Simonon, Simonon fucking quadrupled PKD up. Oh, in true. Novels. His his body count is so much higher. 
and quality, I will say. That's my Ooh, spicy. for my review. All right, well, sh- shall we, should we move? Any? Do we need to, any other thoughts? Not really. I don't, I don't have any. <laughs> We're in fan favorite segment. We just did read another book. Bitch. And so, therefore, deal with this. <laughs> We're putting people into... Do you guys into... think it's a problem that the name of the segment doesn't have anything to do with Harry Potter? Like we, It we does have something Potter to do with Harry song. Potter. I don't get it, though. Okay, it's a I meme, don't get dude. It. It's, okay, I'll explain it right now for all the listeners. <laughs> okay, I'm sure that listeners probably are confused, too. Like, why isn't this yeah. called, like, Harry Potter's The Segment? Okay, it's called... We literally just read another book because one of the on. kind of online memes in the literary community about Harry Potter fans is, you know, oh, please, dear God, just read another book. Like, oh, okay. everyone who likes That's Harry, good everyone joke. who likes Harry Potter is like, oh, it's my favorite book is Harry. It's all they've ever read. And the meme is just read any other book, please. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I get yeah, it. That re- makes that this a so funny now. I, I've, I've, I've kept my, I've kept my mouth shut for like twenty. Oh, this episodes. is like our thirtieth episode almost, dude. <laughs> and I just I was just like I, every time I was just like I don't totally get this. Just see, I was like for months. <laughs> like why are we calling this the Voldemort? So early? I don't know. I was trying to think of something else. Mm. All right. Do you well, get it now? Does it make name. sense? Yeah, it's okay. good. Yeah. It's a good name. It's something to spam yeah. when everyone's like, "You're so Hillary Clinton is kind of like Hermione," and you just be like, "Please, please, dear God, read another book." Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and now we we literally just read another book. Yeah. So wow. So that means we're allowed to talk about Harry Potter. And that's where we need to now. Does Glenn Runciter is he a is he a <laughs> <laughs> Gryffindor? I want Glenn Runciter. I, I want to know where. I, I, yeah, I just want to know where Don Denny is. <laughs> Don Denny. French Spanish. <laughs> oh. French Dude, Don, Spanish. Don Denny was my personally, I got the best vibes off that guy, and I don't even know why. But I'm sad he was uh, he yeah. was gone. Don Denny was a vibe. I don't want to meet Hollis. I was annoyed I didn't get to meet Hollis. I know, we never meet Hollis. We never meet S. Dole Melopone. <laughs> <laughs> Such a great like I literally names. I want a whole fucking spin off. Of a novel about S. Dole Melipone. So yeah, bad. It's called Melipone. It's called. <laughs> uh, all right, well, we can't go through all these fucking characters because there's like 50 in no. this book. Let's yeah, just do let's... like three. So, yeah. obviously, we got to do Joe Four. Ship. Yeah, we got to do Chip. Glenn Runciter. <laughs> and then Pat, maybe? Pat Conley? Or, and Jory. I think we have at least have to do Jory. Well, Jory is definitely. Let's Slytherin. do four. We'll do four. We'll do four. Jory's a Slytherin. It's over. All right, yeah, Jory over. Slytherin. Everyone agree? Yeah, yeah, over, yeah. done and dusted. All right, what about Pat Conley? Uh, she's a she's misunderstood. I think Pat Conley is misunderstood too. I'm kind of with Matt. I think but she's kind of a wow. Gryffindor. I don't think so. I think she uh, actually, honestly, thought she was killing the people, but wasn't. But she thought she was. Oh, so you think mm. Jory like put it in her head that she actually was in charge, and then she loved it? I think she was kind of working with Jory. Yeah, uh, that's how I read it. And then, uh, in the end, though, Jory just eats her too. Yeah, but I, maybe no, I think he actually had said at one point though that he couldn't do everything without her power. Though, did he? Like say, he needed oh, her power. That. No, he didn't. To, he didn't. He didn't. No, no, no. He, he, he. I, that's what he happened. Said, I remember. I read it. No, he said he needed her <laughs> because she was a the, the most useful, uh, plausible scapegoat, like, deniable scapegoat. Because oh, of her she's power. Oh, she's a scapegoat. Right. Yeah. Oh. Right. She's, so he, he wasn't was actually like, using her power. He was using her power, but as like a yeah, a explanation that was more readily available than because no one knew okay. he existed. I wanted more. I wanted more of Pat too. I wanted to see more of Pat. And again, like, introduced as though she's going to be hot shit, and then she disappears. I know. Yeah. Frustrates. And also, her power is like the most convoluted and uh, disorienting. Yes. And then it's, I guess it is kind of used to like always be this thing you're thinking about as possibly happening. Anyway, uh, I'm going to call her a Gryffindor, bad I, Gryffindor. I kind of, I'm, Whoa. I'm kind of into it, Matt. I, I, I you know what? Yeah, I Wrong. agree. Wrong. What do you, you, <laughs> you still say Slytherin? 
Yeah, she's a fucking total slip. Dude, I don't know. Slippery, snaky, slithery Pat Connolly. <laughs> Well, when you say it like Imagine that, it sounds like maybe she should, should be. Jesus, dude. Whoa. I'm, okay. I'm actually uncomfortable thinking about any of these characters being, like, five years old or whatever and going on the freaking train to Hogwarts. Like, they don't belong there. <laughs> None of them belong there. Okay. It's all hypothetical thought experiment. Glenn Runciter. <laughs> Imagine him in the fucking Harry Potter robes just on the train. <laughs> He's a professor. He would be a professor, dude. He's Gryffindor, dude. He'd have a yeah, warthog Patronus. He's Gryffindor, dude. He, I'm going to call him Huffle. Whoa. Whoa. What? Strong Neville Longbottom style Hufflepuff. Oh, okay. Neville Interesting. is a Gryffindor. Okay. Oh, he's Gryffindor. Fuck. Yeah, dude. Wow. Literally read another Harry Potter book. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. You've read too many other books. Uh, You've read... <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Uh, yeah, he's 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 a Gryffindor. Okay, I'm gonna call him. Yeah, uh, he's well, a I, he's a, I'm, Glenn Runcer is a Hufflepuff. I would still stand by that. Oh, what's your I evidence? Pretty, I I think he's like loyal. I think he's a Gryffindor. I mean, he's loyal, but he's also like brave. I don't. Is he brave? I think he doesn't want to I mean, lose. I don't think he doesn't want his company like, to shut down a bit. You might yeah, be right, man. He's kind of like armchair. Like I want he's my like company a good boss. to survive. He loves his wife and he loves his employees. Yeah, he'll like yeah. He, you know. There's his bottom line is get affected, but he'll he'll kind of go to bat for his fucking people. All right, I'm gonna I'm, I mean, gonna, I'm I, gonna skirt skirt here, and I'm I'm on I'm kind of with Matt now. He might be. A, I'm totally a Hufflepuff. I mean, I just don't believe a Hufflepuff can make a company that deals with <laughs> anti precogs. That I, I I just don't feel like a Hufflepuff could do that. The com- the type of company that a Hufflepuff would make would be like a paper company or a logging company. <laughs> Not some sort of like, you know, hyper scientific, psychic Wait, company. You don't you don't dream to with imagine. team leaders. You got to dream bigger, <laughs> darling. Inception. Yes. Listen, I just, Paul. I don't, I don't you, need put, you need to put. You need to put it in them. The world of Harry Potter into the far flung future of 1992 and what <laughs> these people would be like. <laughs> <laughs> when there's yeah. a, the neo homeo pape machine or whatever they're using, dude. I'm, with, I'm actually with people. Matt. I do think people should make fun of how wrong people from the 1960s and 70s were about how <laughs> advanced we would be in 30 years. And also, they're not. like, we're definitely gonna be flying. We have like a uh, we can go to the moon whenever we want, but we also have like a fax machine that's like yeah, gives you a re- text like, message what receipt. The fuck. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. He's right. he's he's strong Hufflepuff, Matt. I'm with you. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Wow. Well, I I disagree. Okay. I disagree That's that. fine. That's totally fine. Um. Joe, Chip. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Doritos. Ravenclaw. He's ooh Ravenclaw. What? In, yeah, I think you might be right. What's your what's your <laughs> yeah, rationale, yeah. Matt? Well, because I mean, at, at, most superficially, he's like a. a What's the word? Didactic or or no? Where you're trying to teach constantly? You're always trying to correct. He's a. Uh, it's like a ped- pedagogue. No, it's like a. Oh, he's pedantic, like pedantic. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I I think there's just like this weird. Uh, After that hmm. paragraph that I read, where that woman describes how Ubik works, he jumps in and is like, oh. Actually, it's redundant. All neurons are, or all ions are neutral, or some shit. Are negative. Yeah, ne- yeah, negative. Yeah. Well, it's too bad he didn't say reducto. <laughs> <laughs> Reductio. True. True. Um, I'm not as strong on this one as I were on the other two. I just feel like he's got this kind of um, the detective thing. Like he's got this kind of like bizarre. Like you know, he's he's not a super emotional guy. He's kind of like thrown out of out of, for a loop by all the stuff that's going on but he's more just kind of like detached and and super like professional and nerdy and like interested in like figuring it out and he's he's the we should probably say we haven't that joe chip has no psychic talents whatsoever yeah his entire job is to like measure other people's psychic talents yeah we should he have just uses that all the cool the equipment five minutes he's got the He's got the Wait, like. Is he a tester? He's a tester, right? He's a tester. Yeah, yeah. John Tester. <laughs> Joe Tester. Joe Tester. 
he does this book's version of the Voight comp test. Yeah. Basically. So yeah. that's actually kind of plausible, Matt. Yeah. All right. I like Ravenclaw. I'm going to say just Gryffindor because he ends up, he takes over. Uh, <laughs> I feel like Ella's you're not taking position. this seriously. Paul, he takes agree? over Ella's position, and Ella's a true Gryffindor in my That's mind because she's That's fighting true. the internal fight. Ella is 100% a Gryffindor. Yeah. yeah. It's too bad that Ella and Joe Chip didn't have a vanishing cabinet. Ah, uh, if only. Like, if only Glenn Rin- Rinsighty <laughs> just in- interjected a vanishing cabinet within the hellscape. Imagine if world. Joe Chip had a Marauder's map for the... <laughs> He would know where Jory was at all times. <laughs> oh God! Oh, I read. I I saw a really funny meme once where, um, uh, Ron's brothers, the twins, who had the map for years. Yeah. What are their yeah. names? Uh, I don't remember. Well, yeah, the meme was like, why didn't they go into Ron's room and see that Peter Peter Pettigrew was there for like twelve years? True. True. He was just a rat sleeping with Ron. He was was a man. (laughs) Does anyone else need to be put into a house? Need is a strong word. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I don't think so. There's no more like real heavy hitters. Yeah, yeah. I wish, like I said, I wish we had met Hollis. I wish we had met Esdol Melipone. (laughs) Yeah, come on. <laughs> Give us the pwn. I know. <laughs> the pwn. All right, so uh, that leaves one one thing, boys. Score. Scores. Score time. Paul, you have to go last because this is technically your book. It is my, it is. Matt? Not technically. I no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally, it's quite, quite literally your, your Quite pick. literally, I picked it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm still kind of a mess in terms of how I think about this book. Yeah. Matt, do you want to go first, or do you want me to? Uh, I'll go. I, I'll go. I'll go. Yeah, I can yeah. do it. I can do it. I, can do it. <clears throat> I. I. But I am. This score maybe is. This score is provisional in some ways. I. I feel deeply messy about this book uh, right. and how I feel about it. It's, you know. Like I said, there's passages that are brilliant, and we read a couple of them, and then, but overall, the experience was very fucking jarring and strange, and I'm not, I don't know if it was in a good way. Uh, I'm at like a, I'm at like a 2.93, I think, yeah. is, is, is what I'm going to say. Like, it's, it's. It's very fucking borderline for me. Like if maybe if maybe if I read more dick books, it's in books, the pleasure area. Yeah, maybe <laughs> if I read more dick books, it'll get like I can <laughs> get, get get more like pleasure? accommodated to his style and shit, and it'll make more sense. But um, something about it was just like off for me in a way that that that, that never clicked. Um, yeah. and so I don't know, maybe, you know, cause I was thinking and I did look and I was looking at, uh, both, uh, the closest analogs in terms of books that we've read for the show so far, great work of time and lathe of heaven in terms of like yeah. weird time travel shit. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to make sure my score was consonant with the, the fact that I liked both of those books significantly more than I liked this one. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I was I was on track with that, and I think this score reflects that. I completely forgot what I gave those, but and I, I can I can tell you if you want. Maybe yeah. I'm not copying. So you gave you gave Lathe of Heaven a three point six, okay. and you gave uh, wait where, the, <laughs> where is it? Hold on. It should be uh, that, below that was, it. Below or yeah, yeah oh yeah yeah yeah. And you gave that one a 3.7. Yeah, I did like that very much. Yeah. Uh, well, which one? Which one was that? Great Work of Time. So basically okay. 3.6, 3.7 for those two. Yeah. Well, my, my, my provisional number, which you did make me more comfortable in saying, now that you've spoken, was a just straight 2.9. Nice. Yeah. Do, any, any more? Nope. <laughs> any Leave more me alone. <laughs> okay. All right, Paul, what do you say? 
This is surprising, but it's it's lower than your scores. Oh shit, let's go. Uh, I think I'm at like a two point three. Yep. With this okay. one. On the negative end. Yeah. Yeah. How come so how I come? I don't like, think what you was have it to for read you, Paul. Well, what's a two point five is like average. Yeah. Two point five. Below is like that fine. is like you don't have to read I don't think you have to read this book. Yeah. That's I think that's an overarching belief I have about it. Um, Hundred best English language books of all time insane, in the world of all time. Insane fucking. That's an insane, insane thing that made thing. me. I literally just want, like I want to talk drop. to the person who wrote that list so bad. Got yeah, it, it, that made me angry. It made me, like you know three or four points drop because of that alone. <laughs> I just want to hear the rationale. Yeah. Honestly, the names were so bad, and I've. <laughs> It's like ruined my whole night because I just want to laugh about them. Well, That's a whole point drop laughing. for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. It ruined my experience of reading though because I like these are the worst names I've ever heard read in any book. <laughs> any one of these names would have been horrible, like the worst thing I've ever read in any other book. But they're all in this one. <laughs> and I can't discount that as a bad flaw of the reading experience. S. Dole Melcone. Um, yeah, dude. <laughs> Is it bad? Though? Joe Chip. Bob Dole. Joe Chip as your hero. <laughs> Bob Dole Melipone. Yeah. <laughs> Zoe Wirt. <laughs> it's like he was trying to make the worst names. French Spanish. That he's ever thought of. French Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that his, the ideas that are explored in this are a little more concise, maybe. In, I haven't read Minority Report, but they could be more concise in that one. I don't know. I think he he he's one of these writers that needs to be a little toned down or like controlled a little bit because he can just kind of go off the rails. I want to read more. Like... Yeah, and I, I wouldn't mind reading. It's like unique, a crazy certainly one too. It's definitely this one unique. <laughs> yeah, it's unique. So yeah, two point. What did I say? Two point three. three. Yeah, screw this. Yeah. Fuck this book. <laughs> Don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> I really All like right. giving my own books low scores. It's fun. It's Chad. It's Chad energy. Yeah. It shows that okay. you don't even give an, an F. <laughs> I don't. If uh I had good reasons for wanting to read this no, book. No, 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 dude. It's not a thing. And I want to read more now. Yeah. If anyone's still listening, uh we have a Patreon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How long is this episode? Uh, it's not that long. It's like a okay. two hours, 20 minutes. Oh, <laughs> shit. Oh, oh shit. Still All kind right. of long. Uh, it's patreon.com slash spinecrackers, youtube.com spinecrackers. Find us. Subscribe. Listen. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, good bo- uh, bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye and good luck in you, Beck. <laughs>